All right, well, I think I'll just, I'll start uh, speaking, sort of giving some introductory remarks while people are signing in. So thank you all for being here today. Um, this is the Department of Viticulture and Knowledge at UC Davis. Um, and we are on the road in Kern County today. And what we do is we, um, we go or we try to normally when it's not uh, COVID, we try to go to different parts of California and bring professors and researchers from UC Davis uh, to come and talk to people around the state in person. So hopefully, um, starting in late 2021 and, 20, and into 22, we'll actually be able to do this in person. But for now, this is our substitute, which is to do these things virtually. So we thank you for uh, bearing with us <laughs> while we do this. First of all, I'd like to thank Caroline for help with logistics today. And I'd like to thank Anita Oberholster uh, for help and advice. And she's gonna be co-hosting or moderating. She'll be moderating the second half of the program. Uh, thank you to Tian uh, for thinking about and suggesting topics and speakers that she thought you would be of interest to growers in this region. And while I'm talking about Tian, if you'd like to say a few words. Oh, sure. Thank you, Karen. And hello, everyone. Here is Tian, and I'm the Viticultural Farm, Farm Advisor for Kern County. It's, I'm very happy we actually got some rain today. And thanks to everyone to join our program today and I hope you enjoy all of them. Thank you. And again, I'd like to thank Tian because she actually thought a lot about what uh, subject matter and topics would be of interest to folks in this area. So thank you again, Tian. Uh, well, let's see, I also wanna thank um, our, all of our speakers today uh, for sharing their expertise and their time with us. And um, as the slide here shows you, we'd like to also thank our extension partners because without their support, we would not be able to bring these programs to you. And as you can see, here's a list of uh, both companies and some individuals that have uh, supported our extension efforts. We really appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us today. And I think with that, oh, we have a couple of housekeeping rules. Thank you, Caroline. Um, first of all, you all are in listen only mode. Um, the chat box is really only for general comments. And if you're having an issue tech, uh, tech wise, or you just wanna sort of comment, but if you wanna ask a question to one of the speakers, please use the Q and A um, little uh, comment. You can see down at the bottom of your screen, there's Q and A. If you click on that, you can type a question in there. And really that's the place because if they don't get a chance to answer the question live, then they can actually type an answer in there. Whereas with the chat, it's a little bit more difficult. So please use the Q&A if you have a question for one of the speakers today. And then um, closed captioning is enabled today. You can turn it on or turn it off um, in your own meeting controls. Um, if you would like to have it on, feel free. Um, it is a little, we were, we were noticing uh, just before we started, sometimes it does a really good job with uh, figuring out what we've said and sometimes it's a little off, but it's, uh, at least it's something and we're, we're trying. And with that, we have our first speaker. And our first speaker today is Andrew Walker. He's a professor in the Department of Viticulture and Enology at UC Davis. And he's gonna be talking about grape rootstocks for the San Joaquin Valley. So Andy, I guess if you wanna share your I screen. Find there we go. There we go, does it work? Yep. Good, good morning. It's nice seeing a little bit of rain and then with the emphasis on a little bit of rain, but it's there. Uh, so Tian and, and Karen asked me to speak about uh, rootstocks for the San Joaquin Valley, um, which I've been working on for the last uh, 30 plus years <laughs> um, and continue to work on for that matter. Uh, and wanted to thank the Great Rootstock Improvement Commission who really has funded the vast majority of the, of the uh, rootstock breeding work and development work I've done already over the years. Uh, the Research Foundation also is pitching with that, and the CDFA uh, Nut Tree Grapevine Improvement Advisory Board has, has been a, a supporter through the years, as well as the Table Rate Commission and the American Vineyard Foundation, and Ian J. Gallo Winery, and the Rossi Endowed Chair Funds in Viticulture, uh, which have really been and enabled me to sponsor extra students and take lots of collection trips, which have been fantastic in terms of developing our germplasm, too. Okay, nematodes. So we'll talk a little bit about nematode grape interactions and which nematodes are severe in terms of uh, what we expect to see or don't expect to see in vineyard properties. 
Um, and I think the key thing, we, we usually think about nematodes being restricted to soil types or be associated with soil types. It's really, they're much more associated with agriculture. So if the soils are, are friable and, and easily worked and they're typical agricultural soils, you'll always see nematode problems with them. Uh, and, and when you move into a new uh, area that hasn't been in agriculture for a while, there are very rarely any sorts of nematode problems of those until you start bringing those pests in. So they're not really all that picky about soils. Uh, moisture content to some extent, um, it sl slows down their, their lives if, if they're under drought for very long periods. But in general, they're, they're just associated with, with the culture of plants. Um, the sites that have been in agriculture before, so as, as you take a vineyard out or if you suddenly the almond price starts going down, you take an almond orchard back out and you put, put back grapes uh, in, in their place, uh, you're going to see a very different um, environment for, for nematodes and, and the very severe problems can occur that you weren't expecting. Uh, so sampling, careful sampling and identification of what species you have before you replant, particularly if it's following perennial agriculture is, is really, really important. And again, the perennial root systems last a very long time. We don't really know how long grape roots last, uh, but probably more than 10 years and perhaps more like 20 years. Uh, they're full of uh, phenolics. They can survive for very long periods of time. And I've exp experienced at least seven or eight years uh, where, where populations have been very, root, root uh, health has been very, very good and populations of nematodes and flocks are associated with them. So fallow is a problem. Uh, we usually use that, right? It's one of the tenets of agriculture. You're, you let, let your land go fallow between replanting and, and try to try to let, let the soil re refresh and the nematode populations diminish and, and fungal associations re rework themselves. Um, uh, but it's difficult when we have these situations where those root systems survive and, and, and allow and, and provide a food source uh, for, for nematodes and, and other organisms too. So what effect do nematodes have on grapes? Not, not many until they become chronic. <laughs> uh, they feed on the root tips. The plants usually regenerate new root tips. And that's again why when we plant into high populations, we can really see dramatic problems. Uh, so if you have high populations of nematodes and you put young root systems in that are confined to a small uh, you know, pot, potted sized area, um, they, they can be very damaging on the initial plants. But normally it takes time. Uh, for those root systems to, to the older parts of the root systems to decay and, and that's what really brings on decline very rapidly. Uh, so it's really a, the disruption of the vascular system, both the, the water conducting tissue and the food food conducting tissue in terms of how those plants survive and, and develop. Um, and you'll often see a lot of a lot of nutrient deficiency symptoms that occur first as, as enough of the root system is sort of grazed off and then uh, they're unable to take up as much nutrients in, that, in those cases as well. There's a couple of nematodes that transmit viruses. There, there is problem for more of a problem in the northern parts of the state than the southern parts of the state. So the viruses don't express quite as well in the south or quite as severely in the south. Uh, maybe it's a better system in that, in that regard. Um, but nematodes do, vec do vector uh, certain viruses, particularly the, the Nepo viruses, uh, the nematode vectored viruses, uh, family virus being the most prominent amongst those, but also tomato ring spot. And there's a lot of, uh, of uh, woody plant uh, nematodes and virus associations too. So if you're gonna sample for nematodes before you make that decision about what rootstock to use, and I'm gonna to get to here in a second, um, how do you go about doing that? How, how do you actually sample those things? And, and people have often thought, well, we always randomly sample for a pest population. That's probably a good enough way to go about doing it. But if your sample doesn't have any roots in it or associate with roots, you're not gonna get any nematodes because there, there's a very tight association with them. So make sure you have a soil sample with, with roots in it before you send it along. We generally take off the first six inches of the soil and take the next six or so in terms of the sample. And with drip irrigation being so prevalent now, uh, it's, a, it's an ideal source of uh, sampling, uh, an ideal sampling zone for, for testing for nematodes and other pests too, because the roots are confined and the nematodes will be confined then as well. Uh, don't let the samples get hot. It's surprising people will send these samples that have clearly been 105 degrees, 110 degrees through the mail or, or through uh, shipping, and then they don't, uh, they don't survive that very well. So what sort of nematodes are we looking at? Uh, the dagger nematode complex is one of the more severe, and we call it the complex because it's Ziphonema index we're concerned about, but Ziphonema americanum is very common uh, in almost all of our soil samples, and it, it's not really regarded as being a serious pest. 
mainly because we can't test we can't test it. It will not survive in potted vine culture. It's been looked at for the last 60 years and even longer. And we really need a, a system by which we could test these things in containers and start making decisions about hosts and how to control it. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure that Americanum is actually causing fairly severe damage in some situations, particularly in replant scenarios. So it'd be a good idea to, to monitor those populations more effectively and study how that nematode uh, feeds on, on root systems and damages those root systems. Uh, but in general, the root tips die from repeated feeding uh, and, and then the galling and then the decay from that point. And normally the root system will branch out again above the feeding point, above the tips of that root system, and form another complex of fed upon root, uh, root pieces. And that, that's a very common damage. You get sort of a webbed appearance, um, a bushy, brushy like root, root system um, that, that, that uh, is indicative of. Uh, in, Definitely, index is one of the few nematodes you can almost see. It's quite, quite large. Uh, but it, of course, it's clear, so it makes it very difficult. Once you've been pointed out a few times where it might exist, you can almost see it on a little glistening piece of moisture in the, on, the, on the root system. So it's a very large nematode. It's unusual from that regard. The rest of them are quite small and really need magnification to, to, uh, to observe. The root on nematodes are very common in, that, in agriculture, and they're very common in viticulture, and they're repeated problems in, in again, agricultural soils. And we see them all over the state from north to south. Uh, they're more common in the south and more common on sandier soils, but so is agriculture. Uh, so, so it's hard to say that these things are really defined by a, a given soil type oftentimes, as I said earlier. Uh, as, most, as with most nematodes, they're mostly females. There's the vast majority of, of nematodes in a soil population are females, uh, and they're parthenogenic mostly, so they don't leave males around. Uh, occasionally, there's a, there's a need for a sexual part of the cycle, and you'll, you'll generate under stress normally more males than normal. But in general, they're all females and they have a very rapid turnaround time in terms of egg to egg and individual to individual. So it's a very rapid buildup in, in the, under appropriate conditions. These nematodes actually migrate into the root system uh, from the root tip and they cause very large galls that look sort of like uh, beaded uh, uh, threads of beads essentially. Um, and as the root system grows, the nematodes keep attacking and keep going inside and keep forming these galls. And eventually the galls at the first point, which is now pretty close to the, to, to the soil at that point, those begin decaying and, and, and declining and, and uh, the root system goes there as fail. Uh, so it, it, it knocks off a lot of the root system very, very rapidly. There's a typical um, uh, root knot, uh, root knot, a root, and, and it's it's pretty pretty common. You'll pull these up and say, "Oh, look at that!" If you actually have a, a needle, you could actually poke one of those galls, and pull it apart in the younger part of that root system, and identify the nematode inside and see it actually uh, in those situations. So as the galls crack, as they expand, they crack, as they allow fungi, fungi to get in. And that's really what kills the plant. It's not the nematode, it's the fungal, so fungal attack that occurs into those cracks and, and uh, fissures that, that are caused by the swelling of the nematodes and development. So it's sort of an indirect in, in case, in this, you know, indirect effect in these cases. Uh, and the vines decline pretty rapidly from lack of water and, and lack of nutrients. And you'll really see that the desiccation and, and crop die back and eventual, and of course, nutrient uptake die back too because the root system is failing. So root knots are pretty important. Uh, ring nematode is one of the most important replant nematodes. It can be in, in a thousand up to 10,000 nematodes per liter of soil. So a lot of nematodes. Um, uh, and, and when they are at that level and you replant into a system which is 500 plus nematodes per liter, uh, those plants do very poorly. Uh, and, and it's really part of this major issue that we call a replant problem. It's associated with mycorrhizal association and other things as well. But one of the key aspects of it is this buildup of high populations of, of nematodes. And a mature vineyard does, isn't really affected by those high populations. There's no dramatic impact of bringing nematode on a mature vineyard, but you really shouldn't plant back into high populations. Um, the problem is, how do you knock those populations down? Do we have effective fumigants? Uh, not as much anymore. Uh, do, can we leave, leave these vineyards fallow for a time? Yes, for a time, and it will knock down some of those populations, but they still stay there and they feed on these very root pieces as well. So they're not gone entirely in those scenarios. So you really need to have a, a very effective root, uh, uh, root, root stock and nematode resistant root stock to be dependent upon. Um, we have a couple that are that are quite resistant, a couple of rootstocks that are quite resistant to, to ring nematode, L3916, which also prevents family decline and resists siphonema nematodes too, is quite resistant, as is GRN1, one of the new stocks I'll talk about in, in a little while too. Um, 
The damage from reading nematode is also really is really magnified and amplified by the association with other pests. So when you have combinations of nematodes or nematodes plus phylloxera, you can see these sort of problems a lot more commonly. Lesion nematode is a big one. It's a sort of a, a, a an orchard nematode in many ways. Uh, it's it's really a dominant pest on on uh, walnuts. Uh, it gets onto almonds as well. It can be a, a, big, a big issue. So when you plant, when you pull it in orchard and you replant uh, rapidly, you're going to see damage from lesion nematode. Another one that gets into the root system, migrates through looking for root system for a feeding point, and then migrates out again. So it migrates through the root system too, and it causes a lot of uh, lesions because of that, which is why it's called a lesion nematode. Uh, again, mostly on sandy soils, mostly with tree crops. Uh, but but uh, can be found widely across the state. We have some e excellent populations on campus here with with a very very clay based soil, so it's not really just a sandy soil issue at all. Very broad host range, so it's hard to avoid it, and it's hard to uh, rotate out of it into another cropping system. Citrus nematode, as you might expect, is found mostly in the citrus belt, and again, mostly sandier soils, but that's part of the citrus phenomenon as well. Um, a major nematode in the San Joaquin Valley, but spread up through the northern part of the state too on nursery materials and, and soils and all sorts of other planting materials. It's, it's been moved up to the north part, and there's some pretty severe infestations that occurred around landscapes in, in the north coast where people have brought up uh, mature olive trees from, from the San Joaquin Valley and brought them up bloated with citrus nematode, and that's gone into the vineyards as well in those areas. So uh, it's, it's a difficult, can be a very difficult problem. Remember, these are sort of permanent problems once you bring nematodes in now with, with, without really effective nematicides and fumigants because of environmental concerns, and right, rightfully so. Uh, it's been very hard to destroy these populations, so you're really left with food stocks to control them. Um, so we've been developing root stocks as a group of scientists for the last 150 years or, or longer. Of course, we first developed them to, to resist phylloxera, uh, the, the grape uh, root aphid. And uh, there were a whole series of, of, of species that were tested and developed. And eventually people figured out, yes, these American species are resistant and we can develop new root stocks from them. And that was all done in France and it was all done in the 1860s to 1890s and or 1900s or so. So they're, they're very old responses to a serious problem, but they still are, have been effective. Uh, you'll frequently see Vitus ruperspis and Vitus ruperia in the background of rootstock species, and they're not necessarily useful for uh, highly useful for nematodes. They work okay, but they they have to be in the background of rootstocks because they root well. And most of the other American species don't root particularly well. So if you're ever wondering why there's a complex of these different types uh, with ruperia and with ruperspis, they have to be there to to uh, to allow rootability too. Uh, those two rootstocks lack uh, lime tolerance. Uh, so the, 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 the French went, went to, brought back all those species, tested them, looked at their phylloxera resistance, and then decided, oh, we need lime tolerance as well. And so they had to go back and they bred in uh, Berlandieri. So you'll see that stock a lot, uh, quite a bit as well. Well, that species quite a bit as well. So what, what were they selecting for? First and foremost, uh, phylloxera resistance, and then horticultural characteristics. So these were primarily nursery people who developed these rootstocks. They were looking for decent looking mother vines that could produce a lot of cuttings from and that would root well and that would root uh, well or grow well in wet or dry conditions. So they were thinking about how to really evaluate and, and, and utilize these materials too. They were looking for larger, deeper root systems. They were looking for shallow or fibrous root systems. And, and that's really how we defined a lot of our, our roots at this point in those sort of major categories. And again, developed not under US conditions, not under California conditions, developed under, under French and Italian and German conditions mostly. So there's uh, some important riparian investor stocks for, for the San Joaquin Valley, but not many, uh, because they don't really have exceptional uh, drought tolerance or adaptation to, to sandier soils or droughty conditions. But Schwarzman is not a bad one. It, it's um, moderate in terms of vigor, maybe not, not maybe not vigorous enough in some situations, but you can always solve that with, with water and fertilizer uh, or in vine spaces as well. But it's, it's done well against root knot nematode, nematode, done well against uh, dagger nematode, moderate against a lot of the other nematodes as well. And it's really sort of been underutilized and it propagates pretty well. <laughs> so it's, it's been a stock that's not been used widely in California, uh, pretty widely used in Australia and, and a lot of the sites that we would be typical to what we'd be using in the, in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. 
Uh, Berlanda riparia, that, that grouping is very common in Europe, but it's, for, it's really for more of a continental climate and more moist soils. We have one rootstock that probably would be appropriate for the San Joaquin Valley, 5BB, which is moderately vigorous, uh, has good, broad, general nematode resistance. Uh, not enough to really be planted in the high populations, but, but uh, not, not too bad in terms of being able to, to moderate and, and control moderate conditions. This, this group is generally too weak, and so they're more shallow rooted, more fibrous, and, and not as uh, uh, broadly adaptable to dry conditions as we need in California most of the time. The Berlanda by Repestris group has a couple of them that would be appropriate for the San Joaquin, deep, the San Joaquin uh, 1103 Paulson, uh, a very uh, interesting rootstock. It has a root system that's a lot like own roots. So those of you who have grown own rooted vines or still grow them in some, some spots uh, from lack of uh, phylloxera pressure and, and lack of nematode pressure too. Uh, those root systems are very fibrous. They're very deep. They have, they have all classes and categories of root systems in them. So they're very, it's a very diffusive root system in many ways. And 1103 Paulson sort of mimics that. Most of the root systems are not, not vinifer-like in many, many regards. So they, they, those are, they have relatively good resistance to nematodes, but what they're really good at is just producing more roots. Uh, so when these nematodes, the, these the nurseries have actually promoted these things for the use uh, against nematodes and they work okay, but they are actually aren't very resistant. They're just resilient. <laughs> so the 1103 just keeps pushing roots and sort of avoiding nematode pressure. Same thing with, with salt damage. It, it gets to, it does pretty well with the fairly saline soils until it's too, until it's too, too far beyond that point. Uh, so there's sort of a, a break point with both of these. And there's also a sort of a lifespan with them. They, they tend to be fairly short because they get to a point, and if you're under intense nematode and or saline conditions, uh, they'll start declining earlier than you'd expect them to. And it's really because they're not, not resistant, they're resilient to <laughs> that sort of funny phenomenon. 140 is not bad in terms of salinity, one of the best of all the common stocks in terms of salinity tolerance. Um, um, and we don't use enough of it. And it's not all that available, but it's, uh, it's useful and we should push for more development of the nurseries. The Champinii group is, is a group that, that includes Dog Ridge and Ramsey and Harmony and Freedom. Their resistance is, to nematodes is pretty general, uh, not, not to, well, not perfectly, but good general resistance and moderate, I'd say, overall in terms of in terms of their, their behavior. Uh, we, we've collected and we've noticed uh, more aggressive strains of root knot nematode in particular developing on harmony and freedom. And if we haven't really looked after Ramsey for quite some time, but well, I'm sure we would find them there too. So there, these populations do become more adaptive and you wouldn't want to follow uh, in any case, you wouldn't want to follow a rootstock with that same rootstock, and that would be wise advice with, with most of these things. So make sure you're rotating out of uh, your root host is, is root host is rotated out as you go from generation to generation. Well, 3916 has been used a fair amount in the San Joaquin Valley, particularly in the northern parts, but also in the south uh, to address fan leaf. And it's one of our few uh, rootstocks that it really has a good purpose against viruses. Uh, it was bred by OMO uh, many years ago and uh, sort of selected and, and, and optimized white lighter and coheme. Um, it has very good resistance to dagger nematode. And in fact, it may be a natural nematicide. And what do we mean by that? Well, it may be that you could plant a vineyard in 03916, and it was in a population of fairly high dagger nematodes and, and a family tissue as well, and it would decline and maybe vanish over time because the population of nematodes wouldn't be maintained. There's no, no host stability. Now that assumes that there's no other crops uh, in the area and no other roots in the area that might actually uh, uh, allow Zipphonema to survive. Uh, so this is just a few caveats that are important, but it, it definitely knocks populations down remarkably. Now, I'm not sure yet, and I'm not sure you can live long enough to find out, but not sure that you that that you get to the point where they're gone. Uh, but they're certainly radically decreased. Uh, so we we see a really positive influence of that from from this root system. It's half vinifera um, for various reasons that we won't go into now, um, but it has never failed the phylloxera, which is interesting. So we are always very worried that it would, would actually decline over time because uh, phylloxera or, and vinifera are a very tight association in terms of damage and, and hosting. Um, uh, but it's, it's survived and, and the populations have really not, not been an issue. Uh, relatively high vigor in science, again, a good thing for most of the San Joaquin Valley, uh, less well appreciated in, in the northern parts of the state. But it's quite difficult to propagate. There are a few tricks that work nicely, but it's it's not not an easy rootstock to, to utilize. I've left the slide for you. You can get an idea of where all the stocks that probably are useful for the San Joaquin Valley fit. 
uh, in terms of vigor. And the most vigorous stock up here would be Dog Ridge and the least would be Riparic Loire. And again, these, these less vigorous materials really don't suit the needs for the hotter climate in the San Joaquin Valley and the larger canopy that's required and, and the larger tonnages that are required. Uh, all those things come with higher vigor root stocks. Um, we've been breeding new root stocks for quite some time. And again, there's really important reasons for it. We have very few chemical control me mechanisms. We need to develop some and we haven't really been effective at that yet, quite yet. And one of the major issues is we can't penetrate very deeply through the soil with those, those compounds. Um, we could put uh, uh, so, so water-based treatments in and flood, flood uh, nematicides into the soil, but those will be permanent. They get into the water table and that's, that's not going to happen probably. Uh, but if we had local fumigants that really dissipated well, it'd be useful, but again, they don't really penetrate much below two, two and a half feet. So again, the nematodes, these are persistent and they're on these, these decaying and still surviving root systems down underground. So it can be sort of tricky as well. Um, I left a paper here, a citation for you, that's really useful. It has all the, all the associations with, with many rootstocks and, and many nematodes. It gives you an idea where they all fit together in terms of resistance. So it's a, it's a useful, if, if you never, ever need a copy, just send me an email and I'll bounce it back to you. So we've been developing rootstocks to address a lot of these problems. Um, and this series of GRN rootstocks were done for that. They've been out for about... Uh, eight or nine years now, and people are starting to use them a bit more frequently. Uh, they resist all the strains of aggressive root knot nematodes we put on the root system. They resist siphoning index. They resist those two groups of nematodes combined together in a single inoculum. And they resist them combined together in an inoculum at high soil temperatures. And the highest soil temperatures are about 80, 82 or three degrees. Um, at that point, the resistance in champignon based rootstocks seems to be less stable. In fact, in most crop species, not just grapes, but most crops, resistance to root knot sort of breaks down at that, that level. So there's a breakdown phenomenon that occurs, which is, which is interesting. So we wanted to make sure they resisted that as well. So we had it. And then in addition, they have resistance to citrus nematode that's differential. MS is moderately susceptible. MR is moderately resistant and R is resistant. Uh, they would have resist ring nematode differentially as well, and legion nematode and pin nematode. So they, we've, we've looked through quite a few of these things. Uh, and they're, they've been very effective. And two, three, and four propagate very well uh, and have no issues and are, are moderately the high, I would call them high vigor overall from a North Coast perspective. Not as vigorous, perhaps, as, as uh, Ramsey and Dog Ridge, but getting close and easily as vigorous as 11 3 Paulson. Uh, so they, they provide enough vigor for the San Joaquin Valley. GRN1 is, is the funny one. It's harder to propagate. It's not impossible. You have to do a few special tricks uh, and they, they work fine if you, if you manage that way, but they disrupt the, the grafting scheduling in, in the way they have to be produced. It's a very different cycling of, of steps that, that occur. Uh, but if, if you need it, it's possible to, to generate it if, if the, the nurseries will, will follow those, those steps. Uh, GRN5 has been hard to propagate too, and uh, it's, it's lost. There's quite a bit of interest in loss in that one. We've had good trials with the GRN rootstocks, uh, again, to, to base this information on. Uh, again, their vigor is good. Their resistance is, against nematodes is, is excellent. Um, the next question was for a lot of these, would they resist fan leaf? If, if they had good siphoning resistance, would they resist fan leaf? And the answer has been maybe, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so it takes a long time to figure these out. We have these trials in for almost 10 years now. And uh, they're, they're resisting the disease, but we're not positive that they'll resist the whole complex of both the nematode and, and family virus. So we'll see, stay, stay tuned for my predecessor for that in the future. Uh, in those tests, we've put RS3 and RS9, two stocks that I didn't recommend, although they were originally bred for the San Joaquin Valley. They've been too weak. They've been remarkably weak and, and, and they've declined in all those sites. So we've been, it's been an odd, odd uh, scenario too. And we're getting close to the end here. Um, I think I covered most of this, we went through. So come back, look at that too, if you want afterwards. Uh, what do we need for the future? We need better nematode resistance. We always need better nematode resistance. We need to include more and more species with higher resistance. We're to the point now where we have some excellent ring nematode sor sources of resistance and we're blending those in with the other GRN stocks who are developing those. We're doing the same with drought tolerance. We're blending in the, the, the nematode resistance with the, with the better drought tolerance and other backgrounds. And we're blending in salt tolerance as well. So we're bringing those backgrounds together and better virus tolerance. So all those, those things have been happening in the background over the last 10 or 15 years. And they're to the point now where they're in field trials and we'll, we'll begin making uh, recommendations for their use too over time. 
one of the interesting things about the next generation of vineyards is going to be, we're going to be using different uh, species, quite different species, I think, in a lot of these backgrounds. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an alternative, it's going to be a result of, of uh, uh, climate change and warming soils and conditions. And we'll be using species which are better adapted to warmer climates, but not so good against cooler climates. So it'll be interesting to see how they, they fit into the way we use rootstocks. Okay, thanks. And I think we're, we're close to being right on time, almost a couple minutes. Thank you, Andy. Uh -huh. There is one question in the Q&A, which I think we have okay. time. If you wanna stop sharing and then Kendra can start sharing while I'm ask, asking okay. uh, this question is, is there a chemical or chemicals that can be isolated from the roots of the VR039-16 that can be developed into a nematicide? Good question. That'd be interesting to know. We don't know why, those, uh, the O3916 uh, root systems resist zipnema so well. So we don't know why, whether it's a, a compound that's that's elicited or, or whether it's, it's always present. Um, it's probably some phenolics and there's some some uh, some some indication that's that's true in root systems that, that they do defend themselves in that regard. We have a project that's getting close to being finished with an Argentinian PhD student who's coming back and forth through some final testing. And we'll see if we can identify some of those compounds that we're looking at for that for the very same reason. More from the perspective of how do we control that, the, that chemical? Uh, how do we, we amplify it or, or make it more consistently expressible in different rootstock backgrounds? So it'd be a breeding tool that we're looking at rather than a, a compound you could put in the soil. Um, I think that would be probably fraught with all sorts of other problems, but from the, the same question is, is equally as important from a genetic perspective. How could you, you have to identify that compound to, to effectively breed for and include in other backgrounds. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yep. My pleasure. And if folks have any other question uh, for Andy, you can either put it in the Q&A or I believe Caroline also provided his email address in the chat. Yep. All right, our next speaker today is Kendra Baumgartner. She's a research plant pathologist with USDA Agricultural Research Service, and she's also in the Department of Plant Pathology at UC Davis. And the title of her talk today is When Trunk Diseases Spread and How to Prevent Infection. Thank you for joining us today, Kendra. Well, thanks for inviting me, Karen. And I want to just kind of give a shout out. I could just scrolling through the participant list. I want to say hi to some friends. <laughs> I see people <laughs> listening in. Hi, Carmen. Hi, Don Lavisi. It's been a minute <laughs> since we've seen each other. Um, and Franca, too. Hi, everybody. Wish we could all be together in person. Uh, hopefully, that'll be coming up in the near future. Um, I'm going to talk about trunk diseases today, um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with them, I'm just going to give a quick introduction and go through also um, when, when's the best time of the year to see the symptoms. Okay, so first I want to mention some of the people who uh, I work with on different projects around the U.S., um, Gabriel, who um, I think most of you know, um, Table Grape Farm Advisor, a little farther north of you. Um, I work with Gabriel on a study on testing pruning wound protectants in table grapes, which is funded by the California Table Grape Commission and a project scientist in my lab, Reno Travadon works with us on that. And then we also do some work on pruning wound protectants in Eastern Washington with Michelle Moyer. Maybe some of you are familiar with these different wood cankers and symptoms you see in the wood from trunk diseases. Um, these are thought to be the uh, be chronic infections that ca are caused by the fungi that cause trunk diseases. Um, the fungi don't get in one wound and spread throughout the entire vine. They're not thought to be systemic infections. They're relatively localized, we think, near where the fungi get in. But once that wood is dead, um, you know, it's no good to the vine or really to the fungi. The fungi live nearby in wood that looks healthy, although it's obviously not because it's infected. Um, and eventually they make their way out to the surface of the bark where they produce spores that can then spread to neighboring vines. There's no chemical known to mankind that you can spray on the vine that can get taken up and you know, moved into the wood to where these fungi live to kill them off. Um, so the best thing to do is to prevent them from getting in in the first place. 
They spread by spores and these spores, um, we know that rain is important for their production um, and for some of the species for also for their dispersal. Um, that said, we don't know all the climate conditions that are needed for um, production of the spores for um, germination for infection. It's not like with powdery mildew fungus where we have it really dialed in. There's no models. Um, we just know rain's important. Um, and we know that, um, as I said, some of the species are spread by rain splash. They're, they come out of the, um, the bark surface on their fruiting structures in these sticky globules. And when rain hits those and then splashes away, it carries the spores with them. So wherever it lands, those spores stick and can, can then theoretically infect. Wind spreads some of the species as well. Um, Eutypa um, is one of them. Um, it's spread by wind. Um, and then some of the fungi that cause esca, um, their spores have been found in the soil. So these are all possible ways the spores get spread around. Other grapevines in your vineyard that have trunk diseases, those are a great source of spores. Um, Eutypa is one example of a trunk pathogen where the spores can spread many, many miles. Um, and other tree crops can host some of the same species that infect grape and vice versa. Infected nursery stock can also be a source of infection. And I wanna say that, you know, I've listed these in no particular order of importance of sources of spores. Um, you know, we as plant pathologists don't have a way necessarily when we come into a vineyard to diagnose a trunk disease to also say uh, it came in from you know, the neighboring vineyard or this vine right here or nursery stock. It, it's difficult to know once symptoms are present where those infections originated. All of the fungi that cause trunk diseases are what we call wound pathogens. They need um, an opening to get into the vine and that's primarily through pruning wounds, we think. Um, another great way to, you know, get, um, get create wounds in the vineyard is to make a decision to change your training system once the vines are already trained up and mature. Um, when you're up, whenever you're making large cuts to the permanent woody structure of the vine, those wounds can take a particularly long time to heal. And so, you know, whatever you can do to avoid that is good. Um, a couple other, you know, types of wounds that happen, which are, I've put lower down on this list because I don't know how common they are in Kern County. Um, mechanical harvesters, um, you know, they're getting better all the time, but kind of the old school ones do tend to cause a lot of damage to the trunk and anywhere the bark is rubbed off or the, um, the wood is kind of compressed, you know, those are wounds that can get infected. And the trunk wounds are particularly damaging because if you've got a big dead section of the wood right in the trunk, rather than out on a spur on, you know, one of four cordons, um, that's much more damaging to the movement of, water and soil derived nutrients and also photosynthate. And then water, winter injury can cause wounds to woody tissues. Of course, I don't know how common that is in Kern County. Some of the trunk diseases are, um, cause very similar symptoms. I call these the dieback type trunk diseases. It includes Botryosphaeria dieback, Fomopsis dieback, and Eutypa dieback. And the, these fungi all cause, um, the fungi that cause these trunk diseases all kill off fruiting positions. So every lost spur you have, you're losing shoots and you're losing clusters. So that's how these dieback type diseases can really contribute to yield losses that build over time because these are chronic infections. With um, fewer shoots, there's less photosynthate to, to feed the vine, so to speak. And so you'll get a gradual dec decline in vine capacity over the years. Um, the symptoms of these dieback type trunk diseases can appear um, depending on how susceptible to the cultivar is and also how aggressive the specific species are. They can appear as early as years six or eight in the vineyard. Although, you know, the infections happen years before that. Um, there's a long delay between when an infection happens through a wound and when you actually see symptoms on the shoots. It can be multiple years, for example, for eutypa dieback. 
between years 10 and 15, um, the proportion of symptomatic vines in the vineyard can really go up dramatically. And again, this is dependent on how susceptible the cultivar is and how aggressive the fungi are, but there will be a point in the vineyard lifespan where it'll seem like there's more and more vines every single growing season. Um, and that's just, we think in part because you know, those, it takes a long time for those symptoms, those infections to happen. And then um, there's a multi-year delay between when the infections happen and the symptoms appear. Botrytis feria dieback is best seen, the symptoms are best found between bud break and bloom. And the symptoms you'll see will be typically a dead spur or a dead fruiting position and a stunted shoot. Um, the, the shoots uh, look healthy. The leaves are green typically. There's no um, characteristic leaf symptoms that are thought to be associated with Botrytis feria dieback. Um, and this disease, um, you know, these, obviously these dead spurs, you know, they, they don't like go away during the rest of the growing season, <laughs> but they do kind of tend to get um, obscured by neighboring healthy shoots. And often, you know, on this, this cordon is a good example on this vine where you see some perfectly healthy looking shoots with, with flowers on them. You see a dead spur and then you see a stunted shoot. And these were, these separate um, spurs were likely infected at different times by different fungi. Um, although it's also possible one got infected and then the fungus traveled down into the cordon. Eutypha dieback um, also kills spurs like Botryosphyria dieback, but it has very characteristic leaf symptoms. Um, and they're thought to be due to, um, although the fungus lives inside the wood, it it creates these toxic compounds that get carried out to the tips of the shoots and they mess with the, the hormone production in the leaves. Um, and that causes the leaves to look almost like they have a phenoxy herbicide type damage. They'll have a cupped shape. They'll have, um, sometimes the veins will look like they're all growing elongate in a parallel way rather than fan-like. Um, and then you can also get brown spots around the edges of the leaves. And these are best seen between, you know, bud break and bloom. Although, you know, if you hunt through the vineyard later on in the growing season, you'll still find them. Um, for many years, you know, people talked about how we don't see a lot of Utypa in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, but I've seen a lot of Utypa in the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, you know, it, it's a disease that is also very aggressive on apricot and um, some pruna species. And so if you maybe have a ranch, a property with both, you know, apricot and table grapes, you know, the, the spores can spread between them pretty easily, no matter how much rain you have or don't have. If you've got susceptible hosts, it doesn't take a lot of rain to spread those spores. Fomopsis dieback, and I'm showing you the same picture I showed you for the Botryosphyria dieback vine, and it's because we we find both Botryosphyria and Fomopsis diebacks very commonly. Um, they're they're by far the most common trunk diseases in California, and often we isolate, you know, one of the causal species for either of these diseases from most vineyards we we encounter. Um, Fomopsis dieback will kill spurs. Um, the shoots that grow out of it will be stunted, um, but those will have leaf symptoms. Fomopsis also causes a foliar disease called Fomopsis canin leaf spot. And the causal fungus, um, which is now called Diaporthiampelina, it can attack all green tissues on the vine. Um, it spreads with rain. So, you know, we typically only see these infections, these lesions on the green shoots, the green stems rather, um, in rainy springs. And usually the best place to look for them is at the base of the green stem, because um, if those rains happened at all during the growing season, it was early on. And so the tissues kind of that were built on the, towards the end of the shoot, the leaves that formed after that are, tend to not be affected. But sometimes these shoots can get so heavily um, spotted, so to speak, that they, they break off in spring. Um, and you can also get bad rachis infections too that can cause um, the whole cluster to fall off. 
Um, that's more common east of the Mississippi though. And then you get this weird bleached appearance on the canes um, afterward. And we're not really sure why that happens, but something happens to the outer layer of the wood to do that. Um, with these dieback type trunk diseases, if you get any shoots growing out of infected spurs, those could, those will either die that same growing season or they won't push, push out the next growing season. And that, that kind of phenomenon, those symptoms are called, that's a dieback. That's what that, that's why we call them dieback type diseases. If you cut into that, um, either into the spur or into the cordon, you'll find a wood canker caught which is from one of those fungi that cause that disease. And again, this canker, this discolored section, that's all dead. You know, the fungus can't use it. The vine can't use it. The vine literally has to work around it. Esca is another type of trunk disease. It's quite different from the dieback type trunk diseases in that um, it doesn't tend to kill spurs or fruiting positions. Instead, it it impacts fruit ripening and fruit development and fruit maturation. Um, it can also damage the fruit phys uh, physically. Um, it can form spots on it. And that's where ESCA gets its common name of measles. Over time, sometimes you see vines that show the symptoms of ESCA will decline in capacity. Other times they are perfectly and extremely vigorous like this vine pictured here. Um, ESCA can, appear a little bit earlier in the vineyard than the dieback type trunk diseases in some cases. Um, I would say that, you know, the leaf symptoms of ESCA, I don't see that often in vineyards, um, but when they do appear, they can be pretty widespread and damaging on a, on a site basis. The leaf symptoms of ESCA are very distinct. Um, that said, there's a huge amount of variability from vineyard to vineyard and even from year to year um, in severity. There's usually some amount of scorching like you see around the margins and in between the veins on this leaf here. This is Sauvignon Blanc that's pictured. It's one of the most susceptible cultivars in the world, it seems, to ESCA. Um, you get some discoloration. That discoloration can be yellow in between the veins and around the edges of the leaf. Um, here's another example of where it's yellow. This is a muscat vineyard in Delano. This muscat had been grafted over onto Thompson seedless. And I think there was even like some red globe somewhere in those vines. You know, it's, it's kind of the typical scenario of them with table grapes where you've got lots of instances of grafting over <laughs> over the years. Um, and if these fungi um, are, are in the trunk, you know, they, they don't go away completely. They're still there. Um, and then here's um, in this example with Chardonnay, you can see not just some yellow discoloration, but also some red. Um, so yellow or red discoloration and or scorching kind of typify this, the leaf symptoms of ESCA. What I said earlier though is that this disease tends to be very damaging to the fruit development. Um, you, the, the ripening is never really right. You know, the vines will never ripen up in terms of bricks, um, titratable acidity, pH, they'll all be off. In, in the clusters. This is maybe more of, a, of an issue we see in terms of ripening with um, wine grapes, you know, because they're really left on the vine much longer. Um, but there are some table grape cultivars and we're trying to do some more work looking at cultivar susceptibility in the greenhouse and then hopefully some work with cultivar susceptibility in the field to see how some of the, especially the late ripening cultivars are affected by ESCA. Um, and as I said earlier, they make these fruit spots. That's why we call this disease measles. Um, this is, however, the least common symptom of ESCA. Um, you might not never see it in a vineyard that has the leaf symptoms. The wood symptoms of ESCA are very different from those of the dieback type trunk diseases. You don't get wood cankers, but instead the discoloration is in the form of what I call black spots or dark brown spots. Sometimes these kind of make um, form in concentric rings in cross section. In long section, they look like lines. Um, and then a whole, these are caused by some of the ESCA pathogens. Um, and then other ESCA pathogens, which are actually wood decay fungi, they will rot the wood and they cause what's called a white rot. 
and you can see, you know, there's still some healthy wood in this trunk here, but all of this decayed wood is dead. Esca also causes a, a very rapid course of symptom development, a vine collapse technically known as an apoplexy, where within a week, all the, the entire top of the vine will wilt and die. Um, and why the fungus or why the, why the disease sometimes does this versus shows the other symptoms I showed you, we don't know as scientists. Um, there do seem to be some climate, uh, cl climate conditions associated with widespread apoplexy. Um, and that tends to be uh, wet springs. Colleagues of mine in Europe uh, have told me about this and, and we've kind of sort of noticed that to be the case in California too. 2017 was the last really bad year where I had widespread reports of apoplexy from all up and down the state. And that year we had a very wet spring. It was a fourth rainiest winter on record um, and that extended through spring. And then we also had some very hot weather, you know, two straight weeks of very hot weather in July. Um, Another disease I wanna mention is young vine decline. Um, this, uh, and I, I don't know how common that this is in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, but I wanna mention it because it's like each of these uh, trunk diseases are what we would call as pathologists a complex. You have a whole range of fungi that can cause them. Esca is a disease complex, but, but young vine decline is really a disease complex because you have two very different diseases that gang up on the vine to cause it. It's um, some of the ESCA pathogens are involved and also um, root pathogens, which cause a disease known as blackfoot um, or cylindrocarpon root rot is what it was called previously. Um, these, you can imagine how having pathogens, you know, in the wood above the soil line and then the wood below the soil line would be a real serious issue for especially a young vine. And the symptoms can be just low vigor. Sometimes you get some amount of leaf scorching on the, on the leaves or some discoloration. And then if you dig down, the roots um, are, the root system is very poorly developed. This is a photo I got years ago from Rhonda Smith. Um, and you know, when you cut through vines that have young vine decline, they have the black goo symptom, which is what was coined, I think, by Lucy Morton, who's a viticulturist from the Southeast um, back in the mid to late 90s. In spite of the name young vine decline, vines don't grow out of this. So this is a 15-year-old Zinfandel vineyard, which for its entire lifespan has had shriveled fruit. You know, it doesn't matter how few clusters there are or how much irrigation you put on this vineyard, it always has these symptoms. So um, it's a very serious disease. We think it has something to do with nursery stock that gets contaminated, um, but um, it's not widespread so much anymore now that I think the nurseries are doing a better job of calling out weak material. I've listed some of the causal fungi here. You don't need to commit their names to memory uh, because they're seemingly changing on a scientific basis you know, every year. Um, but uh, some of the species are incredibly widespread, like Diplodia seriata that causes Botryostria dieback. Um, it's not as aggressive as some of these other Botryosphereaceae. Um, but again, these Botryosphere dieback and Fomopsis dieback are diseases that are very widespread and common um, in terms of trunk diseases. But it doesn't mean that you type a dieback and ESCA are not important. They're there too. A little bit about managing these diseases. Um, there's been work done on pruning wound susceptibility and I've listed some of the studies that have been published here. Um, but these studies have shaped um, the recommendations and guidelines we use for managing trunk diseases. For Botryosphere and Eutypa diebacks, um, studies in California have shown that um, depending on when you prune during the dormant season, whether you prune early in the dormant season or late, that can affect how long those wounds stay susceptible to infection. Um, so if you prune in December versus in March, um, you know, in December, those wounds can stay susceptible for several weeks to these 
pathogens that cause these dieback type trunk diseases. Um, whereas if you prune in March, it can be a matter of days that they're susceptible. So the recommendation based on these studies would be to delay pruning as late as possible where the risk of infection is lower. Studies done in Australia, in South Australia and in New South Wales specifically, um, have some slightly conflicting results. Um, those, that study, it's only been one study, mind you, has shown that it doesn't matter when you prune during winter, the wounds will stay susceptible for one to two to three weeks, depending on the pathogen. So if that is indeed the case, then we recommend, we as scientists would recommend that you apply a protectant after pruning, a fungicide or a biological control or some sort of physical barrier that minimizes the risk of infection for those one or two or three weeks. For ESCA, there isn't a lot of good news, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> and the, the wounds we think can stay susceptible for up to two months. This is work um, that Akif did years ago when he worked for Doug Gubler. Um, and this is consistent with our studies showing that these strategies that seem to work for these dieback type diseases of delayed pruning or putting on protectants, these haven't been shown to really be effective against the ESCA pathogens. So we're still working on this as scientists to find effective treatments. A technique known as double pruning is, uh, a, is something that Doug looked at uh, years ago against Utypa. And he found that if you make um, a, an initial pre-pruning pass with a mechanical pruner, and the mechanical pruners are getting better every single year. You know, you can mechanically pre-prune a cane prune vineyard. It is indeed possible if the blades are sharp enough and they're positioned in the right way. Um, and with labor costs getting higher and higher every year, you know, the, this type of mechanization um, might be more affordable um, for growers, whether you're concerned about trunk diseases or not. But the idea behind this technique is that it gives you, um, splits up your pruning job, so to speak. Um, so you can prune in December when it's convenient, get rid of the bulk of the canes. Then when you come back in March, make your final cuts. And then whatever you cut off um, is what could have potentially been infected back when you made your first pruning pass. Another approach is to apply a pruning wound protectant. And I've listed a few here that have been found to be in multiple studies to be effective against a broad range of trunk pathogens. Um, this is not an endorsement. You know, we've done studies with Topsin. We've done studies with Pristine. These are both labeled for table grapes in California. They do seem to be effective. Um, boric acid paste has also been shown to be effective, but you have to be careful because um, plants need some boric acid, some boron, but not a lot. It can kill buds. I've listed some organic materials here. There's more and more that are studied each year, and Akif has some good trials on some of these materials, especially some of the trichoderma species. I would just mention that, you know, these cannot be exchanged completely with fungicides. You have to um, change your strategies a little bit for applying them. Um, and one last thing I wanna mention about Vitaseal is that you know the promise that Vitaseal brings is being potentially longer lasting than some of the fungicides that are available. Um, and so more data is coming out on Vitaseal and some of these organic protectants all the time. So stay tuned for those of you who are organic growers. And that's all I have um, to share with you today. Thank you very much. It doesn't look like we have anything in the Q&A. And I think at this point, if something does come through, if you could hang on for a little bit and maybe uh, write some answers if any of them come through. I think if we can have maybe Tian Tian share her slides. Thank you again, Kendra. It's always wonderful to listen to uh, um, what's out there and what to look for. And it's uh, always changing slightly, right? <laughs> for sure, biology keeps us on our toes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, Kara, is that my turn now? Yes. Okay. So if you can, um, if you wanna uh, go to that sort of theater mode down in the bottom right. Okay. Uh, okay, in a moment. Why am I? Right. 
Zoom is not doing the thing it's supposed to do. <laughs> so, uh, certain mode, um, is that in the more section? No, no, just at the bottom there, the little screen, if you see at the bottom of your PowerPoint, along the bottom there are icons, there's a screen. Oh yes, that one. Oh, okay, yeah, I was just like, mm, I, I'm about to start from a current page. <laughs> <laughs> And then you can just use that those arrows um, to progress your slides. Okay, great. Even though we're one year into the pandemic, my skill <laughs> of using Zoom is still uh, inadequate. <laughs> it's it's so, always a little bit different. Let me uh, just, uh, for everyone, I'm gonna reiterate, this is Tian Tian, and she is the new Kern County Viticulture Farm Advisor. Um, we're really happy to have her on board and she's going to be talking today about nitrogen fertilization alters benefits from mycorrhizas in vineyards. Thank you, Karen. Um, Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and I also noticed this is the first presentation I was given as a viticultural farm advisor in Curry and that is my pleasure to work with all of you. And I also say there are some familiar names in the participant list. And thank you guys to give me a piece in mind to talk about something I'm, I'm really interested and I'm passionate about. This study is conducted in uh, Willamette Valley, Oregon as a part of my PhD work, where this work is to understand how nitrogen fertilization in the vineyard can affect fruit and fruit quality and wine productivity. But for my part of view, I'm more focusing on how the, the nitrogen application affect roots and their interaction uh, with the soil microbe. And it's a little funny, I go after Kendra <laughs> because Kendra is talking about the fungus where I really want to get rid of. And my talk will be about the friend of the grapevines, which we want to keep them in the vineyard. So nitrogen is not a stranger to anybody working on uh, working in the vineyards because they're first they are primarily driver for vine vigor, and so when you apply nitrogen, you are expecting to have a bigger canopy, um, and it's also affected fruit composition and affect how the maturity of the fruit and also the compounds in the fruit, um, including the primary metabolites like nitrogen compounds and also the secondary metabolites, phenolics and Roma compounds. And another area to thinking about applying nitrogen in your vineyard is what is the environmental impact? So if you apply too much nitrogen, it will lead to nitrogen leaching and then contaminate the groundwater. And it can also have an effect on soil microbes. And uh, my work in Oregon was focusing on AMF. And I think although there is a quite bit of a difference, variety, climate, and soil-wise uh, between Willamette Valley, Oregon, and Central Valley, California. But there's still some knowledge gained from this study can help us to understand how your nutrient management practice in the vineyards can potentially affect the root and the soil microbe interaction. So who is albascular mycorrhizal fungi and why they are important? So, well, they got the name from these funny um, tree-like fungal structure living in the roots as shown by the arrow here. And this structure is called albascular. And this is the primary site where nutrient exchange occurred between the plant host and the fungus. And their symbiotic relationship plays some important roles for grapevines. The most known one is to enhance vine nutrient uptake. The reason is AMF is able to develop extensive hyphen network. Uh, if we look at the picture on the bottom, you will say some blue fairy balls, and those are the external hyphae developed by the fungus, and they are responsible for exploring the soil and pour nutrients into their hyphae, transfer to the internal structure, and send it to the plants. I find it is a really cool mechanism. And in addition to that, with those hyphae network and symbiotic relationship, they also increase the drought tolerance of the plant, suppress the plant disease, and they improve the soil structure by stabilizing soil aggregates. It is important to note that our grapevine friends are a super host for AMF. For the roots I looked at and the literature I went through, the colonization rate ranges between 20% to 100% 
in the fine roots of grapevines. As the pictures are showing, these are the stained roots. While you clear up the roots and to let those fungal structure reveal, uh, it's whenever you, after you mount those, those roots on glass slides, it is really clear AMF are dominant <laughs> uh, in the roots and then it's 80% uh, of the root cells, usually you will say, they have fungal structure present. So it is potentially AMF like grapevines just as much as we do. But I think another big reason for why this occur is because grapevines rely on AMF uh, for the benefits they can be. So nutrient exchange is always what we're talking about AMF, but before going to that direction, let's say how nutrient move and the resources relocation happen in the grapevines. So the roots take up nutrients and the transfer part of it to above ground and for carbon is go opposite direction. It got fixed in the canopy and then part of the carbon is relocated to the roots. So if we just look at a small portion of roots, you will say those, uh, the fungal drug, the fungals live with inside of the root cell. And this, this cartoon is really cute, but being cute is not the reason for them to be functional, although it is the reason why I got hooked. Um, big clothes is making their active nutrient exchange happen. So the fungus rely on the plant host completely for their carbon supply. So sucrose is gonna move from the plant cell and through the interface and get to the fungal, uh, get to the fungus. And as a return, the fungus will get or resource the nutrients in the soil and then deliver it to the plants. So it is a pretty significant amount of phosphorus coming from AMF pathway. And also with AMF presence, um, some work also find it improves uh, zinc, manganese, uh, and a copper uptake in the plants. So this is the pictures showing the fungal hyphase in the soil. And then uh, let me get my mouse working. So those are the tiny lines you can say kind of in between the the, the soil particles. So that is also the reason why AMF help with soil structure is they will release polysaccharides proteins, kind of glue those soil particles together. And so it reduces the compaction uh, happens within the soil. And so this study, our goal is to understand uh, does nitrogen application change uh, the mycorrhizal association between grapevines and the fungus and how, how that trend uh, were alter the benefits conveyed by this association. So there's a three treatment evaluate in the vineyards. The first thing is no uncontrolled. So those vines received no nitrogen input and UAN32 uh, applied to the soil is the second treatment and N was applied at 40 to 60 tons per acre. In addition to that, we're also looking to how fuller and gonna affect uh, plant growth, fruit quality, and the root AMF interaction. And so fuller N was applied as urea as a rate of 0.8% uh, three times during the season. So there's three groups of measurements we took, including canopy growth, yield, and vine nutrient status. This is the so typical study, a uh, typical measures you will do whenever you're doing study related to nitrogen. And in addition to that, we look into root growth, including the fine roots, where is the major parts AMF lives in, and also it is a uh, is a part of the roots is responsible for. Um, taking water and also nutrients. And for another part of the roots, we call it woody roots. Those are the roots without cortex. Their function is mainly as a conduit for water and nutrients. However, given how complex and interesting roots are, this is our understanding so far. And it is possible the woody roots is playing some role about nutrient uptake as well. So in addition to the roots, we want to look at the AMF um, and then to say how they respond to this nitrogen. And 
the fourth step is to understand how nitrogen affect AMF and then does that affect the nutrient status of the plants. As we talk about in the last few slides, AMF is important for phosphorus uptake. So we want to know if you are putting nitrogen to achieve your production goal, does that lead to some imbalance in terms of vine nutrition because of this impact? But I think there's a hiding fifth goal in this study. It's whenever you're dealing with roots, it's intensive workout. So you can just skip the gym whenever you're doing this work. So the study was conducted in two different varieties, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, and so just as a brief introduction, Willamette Valley, Oregon is a really cool region. And th this raining day we experience in Bakersfield today is pretty typical for the winter in this region. And so in that place, Pinot Noir is a leading variety and Chardonnay gets more popular along the days. And then those grapes are produced to, pre to make premium wines. And so for the soil difference, Pinot Noir block uh, soil is more clay, but in general, they are pretty sealed loam-like. So during the season, we collect the soil at three different timing, reflecting uh, different, not only different phenolic stage, also the different stage where you have um, a very nutrient requirement of the plants and carbon production uh, ability of the plants. Um, so we're pulling the data together and to look at, at them together. So first, uh, let's say what we find in Chardonnay. So nitrogen status improved with nitrogen fertilization. It's make a lot of sense. And, but that's only happened in the soil and treatment. For Fuller and we didn't notice they have in fact um, by nitrogen status across three years. So one thing important to note that is this block started with a historical low nitrogen status. The red dashed line showing here is indicating the threshold um, or the critical values the nitrogen need to meet uh, in order to be sufficient to support the plant to grow. So we could say the blue lines, which is for the control, it is always below the red lines. And only the recent data is showing here and, uh, and we also have Bloom data if anybody interested in it. The things I feel a little surprising is how efficient the soil and in terms of changing fine nitrogen status. We could say a big jump in leaf nitrogen concentration and the patio nitrogen concentration starting from the first year. And so the second we're married is canopy growth. As nitrogen drives vine vigor and a canopy grows, we expected we will see some effect in this regard. So starting from the second year, um, leaf area and the pruning weight increased with the soil and input, but further and again, did not do much. So yield is a real important matter in terms of production. And I know some of you may be laughing now, <laughs> For well, one acre, you only have four to six tons per, per acre. Wow, that's a really tiny vines. And they do. And the interesting thing is when we apply soil and the yield jump one ton per acre, that is a pretty significant uh, for the vineyard in Oregon. But increasing yield for wine grape sometimes not means a good thing because the climate is cool and the vines are small. Plaster thinning is often applied to those vines, so you can have a better control about yield and the right and the maturity of the fruit. And so the low yield is attributed to both the climate and also the uh, the cluster thinning practice used in the vineyard. Um, so we measured all the different components related to yield. The reason we say increasing of, of yield per vine is because uh, the soil and vines get larger clusters as compared to the control. So now we jump to the below ground story. So how soil um, and the water uh, affect the AMF. So in both years, while well, we take a root sample at three different timing of the year, we combine the data together and then to make the data a little bit hard, easier to understand. 
um, is in 2017 and 18, we noticed AMF colonization goes down. That means in general, there's less fungal structure in the roots. That's as a scientist, we all want to say our treatment makes some difference. That's a little evil, but it happens pretty often. And then, but if you look at the number, it's the colonization decrease, probably seven to 10%. Is that really related to the function of this fungus? That is a question we will answer in the next slide. In terms of our best cures, they're the primary side where nutrient exchange happen. So they're supposed to be more sensitive to the nitrogen put in the soil. And they did in the first year, well, when we put more nitrogen to the soil and, it, and, and the colonization of our vascular decrease pretty much. And then, but if you look on the, the year from the second year, the decrease is much smaller. It is suggesting to me that it is a re-dependent response. And it's also probably the, another thing to consider is this vineyard is not so P limited. So even you, even you change the, and that's the reason why you potentially to have a larger impact on AMF is the vines seems they feel safe to reduce, to let the colonization rate goes down a little bit. And then we still feel their phosphorus supply is secure. Or another way to understand is nitrogen added into the soil directly affect AMF. And so the fungus is is just decided they want to occupy less root by root cells in grapevines. The mechanism we don't exactly understand, but the result here shows um, when you're adding nitrogen to a moderate P vineyard, you will say a decrease of fine P status. And patio is a tissue that has, um, you will say a larger impact. And as you say, it seems to have, um, have a continuous effect since you say the peak concentration in the patio is going down from the first year of um, uh, application to the third year. Um, there's another reason why you would say nut by nutrient change. So basically you cannot interpret nutrient data without looking at the growth. If you say the canopy size increasing and this decrease in concentration is possibly because of a dilution factor. And we look at that as well. This, there, the change is disproportional. So that means the P, con P concentration decrease is attributed to both the increase of canopy size and the potentially reduce of P uptake. It tied away the story, nitrogen application to the soil, reduce AMF, and then potentially decrease the, the P uptake uh, from AMF pathway. So that is what we find in one variety. And how about Pinot Noir? First, this block is less nitrogen limited. Soil input still boasts up by nitrogen status. But they're not so low to start with, and they're above the critical values required to maintain a productive vine. Fuller and again did not really differ from the control. So, as expected, um, soil and input also increase the above ground growth, including uh, the leaf area and the pruning weight starting the second year of the experiment. Yield, interestingly, it did not change by soil and input. The reason for that is first, this block is not so nitrogen limited. And the second is in Pinot Noir, generally class of thinning was down more aggressively as compared to um, the Shadow Night block. So that's why probably that's one, that's the two reasons why we didn't say a strong impact um, of nitrogen on yield. How about AMA? Well, if you can roughly remember how the figures look for the Chardonnay block, you will say that in fact for Pinot Noir is even smaller. While they're statistically significant in the first two years, 
AMF uh, frequency in the roots decreased with nitrogen. But if you look at our vascular colonization, it only changed in the first year. And the decrease is from probably 65% to 557%. So that really, really, really changed the ability of AMF to get a phosphorus to the plants. And let's say what happens. So the conclusion is the impact is pretty small. Bloom of patio P is in collected in 2018. It's the only case we say the P status of the plants changed with um, soil and input. That means there may be some impact still going on, but the impact is pretty small. So there's a part of the data I didn't get to talk in previous uh, slides is how nitrogen input change root growth. The conclusion we got is not much. And um, it's the fire sometimes increase a little bit, but um, the percentage of change is pretty small. So how, the reason we say AMF colonization reduced in soil and vines is unlikely associated with root growth. And because when you have more root growth, AMF cannot catch up with colonization. And then you will say a, a lower colonization rate. That is not what we observe here. So here is a brief summary about what we find. As, as the soil and application goes, it is expected it increase in vine, stat, vine nitrogen status, canopy growth, yield for, uh, for Chardonnay and then, but it did not really change the yield for Pinot Noir. And so for AMF, it's, we say in Chardonnay block, nitrogen constantly reduce AMF colonization, but only affect Albascar in the first year where more N is put in. And then for root growth, it increased a little bit on the second year, but it's pretty minimum. But we say even with the change of AMF uh, colonization goes down, it, it seems to affect the vine piece status and we can pick up the difference. So the effects for Pinot of our block is rather small. So AMF colonization goes down in the first two years, albascular colonization goes down only the first year, but it did not affect the root growth or vine pea status. So that means when you have a vineyard with more moderate low nitrogen, but low P, the vines are working hard to put in the resources to support AMF and to let them uh, to do the work for P uptake. Father and did not really do much. The for this trial, the only thing we can do with the father and is we, we find nitrogen in the fruit increasing. Uh, ways for and spread. So a brief take home message, soil and application can decrease AMF and albuscular frequency and how the vine's going to respond or depending on which variety you grow and what's the yield of that variety and what is the vine nitrogen and phosphorus status be before you putting the trial in, before you're adding soil nitrogen. And the soil um, application also have the potential to reduce P status. And the effect is stronger when your vineyard has higher P. So I think the logic behind it is there's a not so good, but makes sense analogy. When there's something is essential, you will put all the resources, the resources you can offer to maintain the supply of that. So I think it really fit the same as why many people rushed to the store to get toilet paper during the pandemic. And so fuller um, application on the other hand did not have um, effect on vinyl trend status, canopy growth, roots or AMA. So this study is conducted in Oregon. How we interpret uh, the result in, um, in, Cal in California, especially for table grip. Well, first, that's climate and the soil has a big difference between those two regions. And um, Cavallis got 50, 51 inches of rain every year. And then I hope in current this, this winter we will get seven inches of rain, finger crossed. And the second big difference is table grape vines have way larger canopy and also high yield. 
they are acting. So they basically have a big carbon source and also a, a big carbon sink to meet the requirement during the growth season. And so how much and after how much carbon or resources they were allocated to, to below ground and how that is gonna affect AMF. Still need more understanding if anybody interested in it and let's talk about it. So uh, last but not the least, I want to thank all the people who have been helped me to set up the trial. My advisor, Paul Schreiner, our technician, Matthew and Sue Ann. Uh, and so without their help, soil sampling will never be done. And also our industry collaborators. And the funding is from Oregon Wine Board and also USDA ARPs. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tian, for speaking today. There are some questions. Um, in the Q&A, but what I think I will do is maybe let you type answers to those because we're running a little bit behind. Okay, um, I'll do that. And maybe Sorry. we'll just, no, 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 it's not, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not you. I think we started a little bit later and oh, um, yeah. it's sort of a little bit, it's a little bit cumulative, you know, it's like one minute here, one minute there. So maybe we'll take like a one minute break and instead of a five minute break, <laughs> But there, okay. are, um, there are questions in the Q&A that if you wouldn't mind answering. I think Kendra is answering a couple that were addressed to her, but there are some at the very top that were addressed to you, Tian. Sure, I will, uh, I will answer those uh, questions by typing the answer. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank really appreciate it. Can we make it a two minute break? Because I'm waiting for the break to go to the restroom, I'm just saying. You know, All right, I'll make it two minutes and we need you to come back, Anita, because of course you're gonna I'm be moderating. Right. <laughs> We have two minutes.
I have to check the time. Hello, it's 11 o'clock or three minutes past 11. I'm back. I hope everybody else is back. I don't know. Your cameras are off. So we're going to go on uh, to our next speaker after our mini, mini break. Um, our next speaker is Akif Askelin. I probably pronounce his surname totally wrong. I apologize, Akif. Um, he's the UC Cooperative Extension Specialist in Grapevine Fruit Trees and Small Fruits Pathology at the Department of Plant Pathology at um, UC Davis. Thank you, Akif. I'm going to roll it over to you. And when we get to the end of your time, I'm going to, you're going to see my video and you know, oh, I need to wrap it out in one minute. Thank you very much, uh, for You did a good job on pronouncing my name. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk to you about understanding the cause of the sudden wine collapse that we have been uh, seeing uh, in California on different location uh, where the wine grapes grow, where the grapevine grows in California. So I'm just gonna give you um, uh, uh, what we have learned so far and then what we know uh, about it. So, um, with that, before I start working on my talk, I would like to uh, give credit to my collaborators uh, on this uh, talk. Uh, Mahir al Rawahni, uh, who is a virologist in our department, who has been uh, uh, working on this project with me, who has been also uh, working on the viral side of, the, of the, this uh, project. Uh, so Neil McRoberts, who is another faculty an epidemiologist in our department who has been also working with us on this project. So the um, rest of the, 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 the colleagues are my, my, my colleagues from our, our, um, uh, my laboratory, uh, postdocs and researchers. Um, the, so we also collaborated with the, with the, um, the farm advisors and uh, as well as the pest control advisors um, uh, the, who have been working on grapevine uh, with this project. So a uh, little bit background uh, on this uh, problem. So th this disease has been seen 2011. Uh, when we first started working on this one, um, that the name of the disease was uh, known as a mystery wine collapse. At that time, uh, we didn't know what the cause could be uh, that the name just stick on that one because causal agents were not known. So now we have a, a better understanding what the cause could be, could be. So we changed the name as um, the sudden wine collapse, which is the, the, what the symptoms look like. So um, the, the, the problem with these, uh, uh, the sudden wine collapse the, the, is that the, the, the sudden death of the wine in the middle of the summer, uh, which is a very common problem on uh, common grapevine trunk diseases, including ESCA, as Kendra mentioned that, so, but I'm trying to, um, to, to give you like a little bit information about that. These were a little bit more different than the great mountain trunk disease, um, the, the apoplexy symptoms that we have uh, seen in the, in the past. Another, uh, the, the point of the, this disease was the fact that this disease uh, has been mostly uh, shown on freedom rootstock only. So that also uh, triggered something uh, in our mind that, that uh, to, to find out wh what we can focus on to identify what the causal agents are. So this is the one of the example uh, that you can see. It is the apoplexy, which is the sudden uh, collapse of the wine in the middle of the summer. So when you see the like that the leaves uh, attach on the, on the wine, that means this wine died within a, less than a week. It didn't even have a time to defoliate the dairy leaves. So that's why the sudden wine collapse is the sticking uh, on these symptoms. So we have also seen a similar symptom uh, on 5PB rootstock in uh, Fresno area, but the, the symptoms were not quite wine collapse. Uh, so we have seen some slow decline, as you can see in this picture, uh, the vines were dying. Some of them look like uh, the grapevine trunk disease, but not quite. Uh, so these are the, uh, the another one uh, 
uh, that we have seen. Again, we are not calling this one the sudden wine collapse. These are the slow decline. We haven't uh, seen many of them. We have only uh, found one 5 PV um, the rootstock. Those are the, 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 the pictures I am sharing with you. So most of these vineyard that shows the sudden wine collapse, uh, millibug was present. So that's like the main, that I'm gonna make the, the story that I'm gonna tell you is the, is the mainly a complex of the disease that I'm uh, going to give you a little bit more information. So, so this is where the sudden wine collapse comes. Uh, so when you look at the, 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 this vineyard in the middle of the vineyard, or it could be beginning of uh, end of the vineyard, you can see a patch of uh, dead wines, as you can see here. So um, when we first uh, start working on this one, that uh, we know that the ASCA group of the pathogen could cause this one, but we haven't uh, seen uh, that this one particular, um, the, the, the ASCA pathogen associated with this. Another uh, thought came in our mind is that the, could it be a soil borne pathogen? Because when you look at the these symptoms, that's what it looked like which is very common uh, phenomenon for the soil worm pathogens when they start from one location and then they spread around to cause a similar problems. That was also in our mind that, that we also wanted to look at if there is any possible soil worm pathogen associated with that. So in here, I just want to share with a, with a drone picture that I took uh, from one of the, the vineyard in Lodi. You can see like the how uh, the, 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 the patches could be uh, big and then cause a uh, kind of problem um, in the established uh, vineyard. So um, I started working on this position uh, uh, late 2018. When I first started, this was the first um, issue that uh, got my attention. So this was occurring uh, mostly in Lodi area. So we had a meeting with the, uh, the representative of the uh, wine grape growers in Lodas, as, as you can see here. We just wanted to, to get an idea. So how we can unfold or identify the, what the causal agents of the, these uh, problems. We actually get the initial funding from the, from the uh, wine grape growers from Lodi. So that's, uh, the, I'm gonna share some of those information um, uh, in this, this talk. Later on, uh, we originally or officially, like the, we originally thought that the, this is only located in the, in the San Joaquin or, or, or Sacramento County area. Later on, uh, when we are um, communicating with the farm advisors in uh, Larry Batiga in UC Farm Advisor in Monterey. So he has also shown us um, that there are some um, collapse that have been seen uh, for a while in their area. So these are the pictures that uh, we took together in, in Monterey area. So Mark Batani is another uh, farm advisor uh, from San Luis Obispo area or county. So actually when Mark and I visited these vineyards, we found out that the sudden wine collapse symptoms are bigger than the, the one that we originally seen in a Lodi area. So this is like the very devastating uh, ones. So um, later on, uh, we start working with the George Zuhan, who is farm advisor um, in Fresno County. So uh, these are the similar uh, symptom that we have seen um, uh, in his uh, the county. Uh, this is the picture um, that, that we took with Gabriel Torres, uh, the farm advisor, um, uh, UC uh, to Tulare County. So again, these are the uh, similar uh, situation. This is the picture from Kern County. At that time, uh, Tian was not working uh, as a viticulture advisor at Kern County. This is the picture that I went there and then took the picture um, of the one of the wines. So all these pictures on all the side that I show you is that the, every single sudden wine collapse vineyard has the freedom roots like that they are showing that one. So if you notice that I didn't show you any sudden mind collapse symptom from Napa, Sonoma and Northern part of the areas because freedom root sac is not common in those area. Therefore, uh, with the communication of the farm advisor in that area, we haven't seen this kind of uh, sudden wine collapse in that area. If, if, if they seen 
uh, wine collapse individually, apoplexy uh, in, in the vineyard, that could be probably primary causing by the uh, ASCA and some of the grapevine trunk diseases. So when we first start working on this one, so the first um, a symptom after sudden wine collapse, the, 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 when we look at the roots of the, the, those collapsing wine was the, the lack of the feeder roots uh, on these wine. So I just want to show you um, a, a, a picture from uh, a, another publication that I just found that to show you that a normal wine, which is the young wine right now here, to produce that amount of the feeder root under the ground. So, so in these, um, the, the sudden, sudden wine collapse, the grape wines, we are missing those uh, feeder roots. Um, so we have also seen the, some discolored wood roots uh, that we also isolated different uh, kinds of the pathogen, including uh, fusarium or some of those uh, black uh, food disease pathogen. So this is the healthy uh, looking roots that you can see there in, in comparison. So why is the, the lack of the feeder roots important? As um, uh, all of you know that feeder roots are the one that uh, get the water and nutrient from the soil uh, by the plants and then distributed to the, to the leaves, carbohydrates happen. And then all those carbohydrates at the beginning of the season, as you can see, until the bloom uh, goes to the roots and then make plant produce feeder roots. During the bloom, plants start spending all the energies blooming all inflorescences, all kinds of things, the feeder root production reduced because those energy goes somewhere else. Similar thing happened after the harvest, plants start producing more feeder roots to get ready for the winter dormant season. If something happened during the, this uh, growth period, if, if um, the, 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 the carbohydrate movement is, is um, um, prevented to the move to those roots to produce the feeder roots, that's gonna be the problem. The plant is not gonna have the enough feeder roots. So this is the, 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 the one of the publication that I found, uh, in the, it was published in 1992 to just to show you the, the, the feeder root growth period season. So I'm just showing you this because from now on, what I'm gonna talk to you is about the, about the movement of the carbohydrate from top to the down. So we also, during the, this uh, survey, um, uh, look into the starch content of the samples that we collected. So we did the very simple, basic iodine starch test, uh, which I'm sure uh, all of you have done this kind of studies uh, in your middle school or in high school. So uh, iodine basically um, uh, they show uh, discoloration when they uh, get in contact with the starch contact. So that means if you see the discoloration, as you can see, that's, that um, a plant part has enough starch. As you can see, if there is no uh, response, there is no uh, starch uh, whatsoever. The one on the, on the left is the before the iodine test. So uh, we, during the, our, um, the, the, the sampling from these uh, sudden wine collapse um, uh, suspect vineyards, so we also did this kind of iodine starch test to get an idea whether uh, these roots are uh, starch uh, depleted or not. So in this pilot study, uh, we uh, sampled from four different vineyards. They were planted in different times and their, their cultivar was different, but we all uh, sampled from the freedom rootstocks because this is the the problem that has been shown on freedom rootstocks. So before we um, uh, sampled the, 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 the those vines, we just uh, ranked these vines uh, as a number one healthy. Three is the, the, the wine with the little bit symptom. Four is the declining symptom. Five is the completely dead or sudden wine uh, collapse. So when we, are, uh, when we were sampling these vines, um, um, when you are start looking for um, a pathogen that you don't know what it is, you just wanna collect sample from every single part of the plant. Uh, in this case, we collected samples from the super so that we were uh, expecting to get some of the grapevine trunk diseases pathogens. 
cordons, uh, trunks, rootstocks, and uh, as well as the, some of the root, because initially, if you remember, we were also suspecting to have some soil borne uh, pathogen could be involved in these problems. So this is the, 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 the results that we got from, the, from our uh, first um, uh, the initial sampling. So uh, we, these are the rootstocks, freedom, uh, number of the wines, ranking from the different. So from the wine condition, advanced declining, healthy looking for different vineyards, they all were showing the lack of the feeder roots. So all these freedom associated vineyards in that area, somehow they had the lack of the feeder. Iodine starch tests show advanced and declining wines has the lack of the iodine or starch. Um, how to looking at, okay, normal level of the iodine test starch positive. All of these vineyards had the millibug present. Um, they have been uh, doing the, some kind of the application of the, or controlling the millibug, but they were not able to 100% uh, control them because the millibug is very difficult to control uh, as you could imagine. So most important part is um, the Mahir has done um, the sampling for his uh, viral uh, or viroid panel and he identified um, uh, grapevine leaf roll associated uh, viruses and vitiviruses. As you can see in here, all the advanced declining and declining wines were both uh, leaf roll associated, uh, specifically uh, leaf roll tree viruses and vitiviruses positive. Healthy lookings, however, could have either one of these, but not both of them. So uh, in here is the vice versa. So there was something um, that, that combination of the, these two viruses were triggering something on advanced and declining virus. When we look at the grapevine trunk diseases, including ESCA, that could also cause apoplexy, all of the wines had some sort of the grapevine trunk disease pathogen. However, we haven't seen any single fungal pathogen, group of the fungal pathogen, that are associated with these advanced and declining. That means we couldn't find, for example, tocninia group of the pathogen caused the ESCA diseases. We couldn't find similar tocninia from each one of them. We found some of them has, has the botrysphaeria, some of them are um, uh, the pomopsis, some of them had the uh, phycronomium group of the pathogen. Another important point here is that uh, we also isolated Fusarium solani uh, from um, the roots of the, these, these vines. Fusarium solani is, is the known soil-borne uh, fungi. Uh, it's a very complex uh, uh, disease. Some of them are very aggressive. Some of them could be saprophytic. But most important part is the Fusarium solani group of the pathogen prefer uh, the, to colonize the roots that are uh, starch depleted. That's like the, their preference. I think uh, with that uh, the story, so this is also a kind of matching that the, some of those soil borne pathogens are, are colonizing easily on those starch depleted uh, advanced decline or declining uh, grapevines. So they are not primary, but they can could come in and then finish the work within a short time. So here's another, another uh, the, the, the picture that we took uh, in Monterey, um, uh, the, the county. So this is the uh, two vineyards next to each other. And then uh, they both um, have the different rootstock. The one on the left is showing the sudden line collapse on freedom. The one on the right is the 5C. I think this picture itself uh, speak um, uh, how these sudden vine collapse are uh, directly associated with the rootstock, in this case, uh, freedom. So this is the close-up pictures next to each other. Also, this picture also taking the, uh, some of the soil borne pathogens could be association <coughs> out of the picture uh, from these as well. So this is another picture that, um, that we took um, in uh, San Luis Obispo uh, area. So as you can see, most of the vines are dying. The one in the middle of the, of the vineyard is escape vine. It's not showing anything. 
It turned out that the, this was the by, by, by mistake. It is not on the freedom. It is uh, something uh, as um, uh, not the freedom rules. Like that's why right, kind of escape points that you can see occasionally uh, by accident that was um, grafted on different root stock than the freedom. We have also seen uh, some of the grapevines are a little bit escaped, showing the less declining symptoms. We also notice that the, those are the one that has some sprouting from the root stock, as you can see here. So those are not showing the, any, any, any symptoms. So this also uh, make us uh, think that the, uh, uh, when the root stock uh, cannot get enough starch or carbohydrate from the top, uh, they start try to push back and then produce uh, their own starch that they uh, need. It. So I'm not going to go through the millibox situation. So the millibox are the one uh, are vectoring the most of the, the grapevine leaf flow associated viruses. So this is the, um, the, the, the the slide that was uh, taken from the campaign who has been uh, working on the millibox issue. So most of the many of the the the, the, the time that I get the question about the why uh, we have start seeing. Uh, this kind of sudden wine collapse in last 10 years. Um, now what's the reason? In my opinion, the reason is that the wine millibug, which is an, um, the, the, the exotic um, the, the, the millibug that was introduced to California in mid 90s. It was first found in uh, Riverside County. Uh, over the years, it moved back to the entire um, a grapevine growing areas in the state. So this is the picture in 2011, in my opinion. So before we have, we were not able to see the, these kind of symptoms um, uh, in wines because wine millibug was not uh, that spread in, throughout the California to, to, to vector the, these um, the, the viruses uh, that has been um, uh, associated with this disease complex. So what is the conclusion for that? The results from the, this study, which is the pilot study we are planning to do, bigger study with Mahir and other colleagues, show that the, both uh, leaf roll tree and BT viruses were present on these vines that were showing the dieback. Grapevine trunk diseases, pathogens, and Fusarium solani were is isolated from, but not consisted one of them. Freedom rootstock is the most susceptible to co-infection of the grapevine leaf roll associated viruses and VT viruses. That was the study that was done by Rohani in 2017. Moreover, previous studies have also shown that the viral infection could also cause the graft incompatibility in certain rootstock, which freedom is one of them. So here's the, our point. Uh, we think that, or, or uh, we hypothesize that um, uh, the, the the combination of the, these viruses are, are causing the graft incompatibility on freedom rootstock. The reason that I'm saying we are hypothesizing is that the, as a plant pathologist, without um, uh, completing the pathogenicity test, we cannot tell uh, this is the main primary cause of the pathogen. So uh, Mahir and I are, are planning to complete the pathogenicity test in coming years. Uh, we have already proposed um, a project uh, for that. So we will be able to give you entire picture uh, whether this is um, uh, gonna support our hypothesis or not. In this case, so far what we have uh, uh, from the, of our, our pilot studies that the, 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 the first from the rootstock reject the sign following the cause girdling the graft union. So um, the, what's happening is that the wine millibug is the phloem limited they are probably introducing the dose, um, the viruses, combination of the dose viruses. That when as soon as the, that virus comes into the, um, uh, the, the freedom rootstock line, that just causes the craft incompatibility. I just want to mention one thing here. So this is not the kind of like the graft incompatibility that you can see black line uh, disease on walnut. That's totally different. The black line is when the rootstock is infested or try to be infested by the virus, the rootstock is just shutting it down completely and then kill the entire plant. 
So it's, and the plant is dying completely. When you look at the, uh, the, the viral content in the root sac, you cannot see on the, on the walnut black line issue. However, Mahir was able to detect a low a level of the, um, the, the viral in the freedom root stock, uh, but we think that the, 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 the root stock is still uh, able to get some of the infection, but causing the, uh, the girdling uh, that could also prevent the, for plant to produce feeder roots that make the plant more susceptible for the sudden vine collapse in the middle of the summer. So, uh, so this is the, 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 the point that uh, exactly uh, what I explained to you. So transportation of the starch uh, depleting is, is the cause of the feeder root, um, uh, the, the prevention in the each one. Previous studies, including uh, citrus um, studies shown that the Fusarium solana infection uh, occurs mostly when the plants are stressed by girdling, which is the, um, associated with the lack of the starch. So, at the end of the, 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 the main conclusion is the interaction between two lifro uh, associated viruses, including grapevine trunk diseases and Fusarium solani are the one that's causing the sudden vine collapse, including um, uh, middle of the summer when the temperature is high. So it's a, it's a real a complex. So we now have an idea which one is the primary, which could be the uh, shutting it down the, the, the cause the dieback in that. So with the information that we have so far, management options are, this is my last slide. So test to confirm the co-infection of the viruses. Millibar control is the essential. I'm not gonna go through, but there are a lot of options. Uh, if you have been in one of Kent's um, the, 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 the talk, so he goes through detail on that millibar control. Removal of the infection, infected grapevine is essential because that could be the source of the not only viral diseases, but also grapevine trunk diseases. So use the less sensitive rootstock when replanting. Uh, again, we still not recommending to rip off and then get rid of the, all the freedom rootstock and then replant it because as long as you don't have the core infection of the, those viruses, you are gonna be still okay uh, getting the economically the the, the, the the vine production or grapevine production in your vineyard. So when you decide to replant it, um, uh, it, it is uh, important to less sensitive rootstock because right now with the millibug, those viruses are all over the California. So most importantly, controlling the grapevine trunk diseases. Um, uh, Kendra talked to you about it. So my lab has been also working on the, uh, not only prevention of the, the, the pruning wounds protection, but also uh, doing the, some um, endophytic uh, grapevine trunk disease controlling. So if you would like to know more about our grapevine uh, pruning wound protection trials, if you visit my lab website, we have some of the reports um, uh, that put in our websites. So, uh, so you are welcome to uh, get some uh, latest information if you like. So as uh, Kendra give you the more detailed information uh, in previous talk. With that, I would like to thank the uh, the farm advisors uh, who has been helping us uh, getting this information and Lodi uh, wine uh, grape growers for their initial support and then my lab group. I hope I didn't exceed uh, my timing. I didn't time myself. You used your 25 minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. And because we're running a little bit behind, let me just see. Um, there's just one quick question. Did you come across any red blotch in your studies? We haven't looked at the red blotch um, specifically, but um, when we were when Mahir was doing the the viral panel, he looked at the entire panel. So there was no um, initial association or direct association with the um, leaf blotch. So the only two viruses that we have seen. Thank you very much, uh, Akif. If you can also just watch the chat or uh, the Q and A a little bit, I should say, in case there's any more questions coming in and just answer it offline, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Interesting, like always. Okay, our next speaker is uh, Mason Earls. Now, Mason is assistant professor at the Department of Viticulture and Enology, as well as in the Department of Bio and Ag Engineering at UC Davis. And I think if I remember correctly, Mason, you've been for with us two years? Almost, going on two years in September, yep. 
Okay, so so everything feels like a year or ten years for me these days. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you, Mason. I'm I'm gonna show up with my video when it's twenty five minutes. Um, and thank you for um, presenting today. You bet. All right, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and thank you guys for having me. I'm really excited to get your feedback and also tell you a bit about what we've what we've started in our lab and where we're hoping to go with it. Um, I should say that most of what I'm gonna talk about today is it's probably 60%, 70% of, of the direction in the lab right now, which is related to yield forecasting. Uh, here I, I said in, in occluded vineyards via large scale deep learning. I'll unpack all that. Let's not, don't have to worry about what any of those pieces mean. The important part probably is the yield forecasting and, and one of the challenges that actually we see with crop estimation or yield forecasting in vineyards and in specialty crops largely across the board is that you just often, you don't always see the fruit wherever you look at it from, you know, whether it's from the ground or from the air, it's not always visible. And so there's a question of how we make uh, big strides in terms of yield forecasting, given some of these challenges that we see in vineyards. So starting off, let's see. So this is something uh, you guys can tell me uh, your opinion on. I'm always interested to hear when I ask someone how well they can estimate yield. And they tell me, well, sometimes I get it really well. You know, I'm right on some years. And then the next year, I may be up to 30 plus or minus 20 or 30% off. Uh, and this fluctuates from year to year to year. And there are different methods, obviously, for uh, estimating yield. Um, all of you are probably uh, familiar with to varying degrees. So this creates a challenge. So if, if we're looking into maybe a more emerging um, methods for yield estimation, they often count visible grapes via images. So this is where a lot of people are putting some effort into. There's also been a little bit of work doing this, trying to look at remotely sensed data and looking for things like these indices you're, some of you are probably familiar with, like NDVI and other types of indices associated with the canopy and trying to relate those to the amount of yield that's on the ground and maybe doing that early, such as evorasion, which is obviously when we would like to know what yield is, is pre-evorasion, because uh, we can actually do something about it. So the problem with this, these techniques is that visible grapes don't always equal what's on the ground, meaning you often don't see all the grapes. They can be covered by leaves, they can be covered by other grapes. Uh, there's all sorts of reasons and that varies as you move along through the vineyard. So it does make it kind of challenging to just use images to do this alone. The other piece is that remotely sensed data, which is the other way that people often try to estimate yield, um, it, it is correlated with yield. And there've been some nice studies that have shown this uh, but again, the grapes are not visible through the canopy and it really depends on what time of year you do this year to year it varies and so there's a lot of variation to be able to say, okay, this is the exact relationship between NDVI across whatever vineyard and yield it's just really not that's not going to work uh, as a robust solution so. So generally speaking, why has the grape industry not adopted these computer vision and machine learning based yield estimation technologies as standard practice so this is what we've been talking about here is. There are some potentially really powerful techniques for doing yield estimation and seeing where the grapes are or making these relationships, but they haven't quite made their way into uh, into industry yet. And so there's a question of why this is. And so it's probably a few of my, I'll have a few slides with the most text I have uh, right here. But one of the reasons for this, I think there are two main obstacles for success. And I've already mentioned this, that fruit quantity and visibility really vary along the row. Um, so sometimes you'll have a lot of fruit blocked and you'll only see a little bit. Sometimes you'll have a lot of fruit visible, uh, but it might be the same exact amount of fruit. It's just that you can't see it. So this can lead to over and underestimation by just counting visible fruit, which has been a big approach in the past. Um, and then the other thing is that we just, I think this may even be the bigger problems that we don't have a large scale, high resolution yield data sets that are readily available to people trying to develop these types of techniques. Now, one thing I wanna hear from you guys about, so if you wanna, contact me after this or throw it into the chat or however you want to get in touch. Um, if you are using yield monitor, yield monitors for your harvest now, uh, please get in touch. So this is, this is what we think is actually a really promising avenue for this research. And I'll talk a bit more about this is that we, many people actually do have this yield data sets for some fraction of their vineyards. And if you don't, it's actually, there's a, it's not too difficult to equip your harvesters with yield monitors. They're about 10, $15,000. Um, but 
you know, the price of a yield of a harvester itself is much more than that. So it's a pretty small fraction of the total cost of the harvester. So let's think about this a bit more. So what we think is that if we had a larger scale data set, and we've already started accumulating this, I'll show you in a minute, uh, that we could actually take advantage of some state of the art computer vision models to start learning this interaction between how visible the fruit is and canopy occlusion. So meaning just like how much the canopy is blocking the fruit. And we might be able to start more accurately forecasting yield by doing this. So what, what are we doing? So one of the key innovations that we're working on is that using the yield monitor as a large scale ground truth data set. So again, going out, finding people uh, who either currently have yield monitors on their harvesters or who want to put yield monitors on their harvesters. And what you end up with from yield monitors, you can get very high spatial resolution. This is, uh, I would say it's about four, this is 400 meters across. Um, so about half a kilometer uh, across. And you get every one of these points as a yield value, right? Every one of these is rows is an aerial image looking down uh, on that. And so you can kind of see how that yield is spatially distributed across your vineyard. So we think if you have, excuse me, if you have that data, we can use that to start training models, especially if we have enough uh, where we might be able to make forecasts on yield pretty early season and do it accurately. That's the goal. Second, we, we need something that also is easy to deploy on um, it, within your existing operations to go out and just tag along and collect ground-based imagery uh, throughout the season. So we've been developing, got another version I'll show you in a minute, uh, a sensing kit that you attach to the front of the tractor, it plugs into the battery right there and it just turns on and off whenever you start driving through the field and starts collecting data and kind of manages it all right there. So that's that's the big picture vision. We're, we're making our way towards that now. And then finally, there's really not a great way right now to bring together ground-based imagery from these ground vehicle observations with remotely sensed data. And so that's something we've been working on a lot from the algorithmic or modeling side, um, because I think there's also a lot of potential to make these predictions from the ground-based data, remote sensing of the yield monitor earlier season, if we can kind of pin this framework down. So what's our target? So this is our target long-term. So this is probably a three to three to four year goal uh, is to get down below 10% error on block level yield prediction reliably at pre -veration. What we really like to see is being able to do high accuracy at several meter resolution, but we wanna just start with kind of a uh, this goal at the block level um, to see if we can get there first. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about some of the work that we've done toward this so far and, and tell you a bit more about where we're planning to go. Um, so this is our first, this is first what we did and I'll kind of run through this very quickly. So we first went out and said, okay, let's take images, count the fruit and try to relate that to yield. And that's been done before more than once. Um, this is the team in the lab right now that's working on this. We have a number of engineers across several different disciplines all the way from the comp side, computer science side through systems kind of like electrical engineering integration and mechanical engineering. Um, and here's where we were at for our first effort. This was in the 2019, fall of 2019 around harvest out at um, in Lodi and or outside Galt more specifically, uh, zooming into this specific location. And just we'll show you a bit of what we had here. So we do have the yield monitor as a large scale ground truth data set, as I mentioned earlier. What that looks like is this. So I won't go into the details here, but you get about one to three meter resolution um, of your yield uh, within the field. So we ended up, um, the first thing we did was we had about, this is right when I started, we had a few weeks to do this. So we grabbed some, uh, this is a graduate student in our lab, grabbed, set up a system where we could go out with a GoPro and some other things and just get some imagery before harvest happened. We said we need some data before we have to wait another six months. So we did that. We built some um, machine learning algorithms to pick out which images look good versus throw the bad ones out because that's the first thing, some quality control. Uh, go in and this is a standard way of doing machine learning called supervised learning where you go in and you basically have a human just draw where they see grapes. So grad student did this and we went in and built a pipeline for processing this data and trying to uh, see how well we could predict where the grapes are at. And it did really well. So these are the predictions. This is images that never saw before. You can see it kind of putting boxes around all the different clusters of grapes. And this is in a fairly occluded uh, vineyard. And so there was a question though, we, we ended up realizing we're, we're not making the prediction, the prediction's not as good as we want it to be. Um, and I'll show you that in a second. So we had a really good prediction as far as picking out the grapes that we could see in images. So this is just showing you all this is, is the 
on one axis. These are just pixel values. So don't mind any of the numbers or anything here. All you have to look at is the correlation here between the two. So this is basically the observed number of uh, the observed area of grapes versus the predicted area. And we got a really good correspondence. So you could see it, it learned what we saw in terms of grapes that the model did. Um, but there's this question of how you go from pixels to kilograms. So how do you go from what you see here, even if you can count grapes or you can measure the area that's occupied by grapes in an image, how do you go into, uh, how do you make predictions of actual yield, which is in units of mass, which is what we care about because that's what we get paid for. And when we looked at this, we said, okay, let's take our yield monitor data and compare it to the image-based predictions. We pretty much, if you see what I see, saw no relationship or very little relationship. And we thought, okay, what's going on here? This is not real satisfying. We can predict what we see, but we can't predict uh, what is being measured on the ground. So we asked this question, well, maybe the yield monitor is wrong. We're doing a great job of making these predictions from what we see. And it turns out that when you just do a quick, you correlate the hand harvested weight on a subset of vines with the yield monitor at that same point, without doing any smoothing, which we, we could have done and probably made this a much stronger correlation, you, you get a decent correlation just by doing that. So we concluded, okay, well, we're wrong. So now why are we wrong? And we started digging in to this by looking at specific areas within the row and realizing that we're often missing, there's this visibility issue that I brought up at the beginning of the presentation where sometimes you see, you really don't see many grapes and it will under uh, predict, or you may see a lot of grapes, so much so that it's pretty sparse canopy. You can see through and you're double counting by seeing the other side of the canopy. So then we're like, oh, well, we've got a double counting issue in places, or we've got an undercounting issue in other places. This is clearly multiple sources of error that could be contributing to our inability to predict what we see on the yield monitor. Um, so there's a few different potential sources of error, which we thought about. I won't go into all those here. Uh, and what we did was thought we'd take out the middleman, which is uh, the fruit counting. And this is a technique in deep learning or in machine learning called end to end learning, where you basically just say, let's, let's forget about doing the thing most people do, which is counting fruit. Let's just try to give it the model, the yield data and see how well and show it the images and see if we can just directly predict the yield. Let's not worry. Let's see if it learns to count. Let's see if it learns to see things about the canopy we don't see. Um, but to do this, we had to do some some other work. So we started developing the sensing kit at the same time because we didn't want to just be using the GoPro system. Uh, it had a number of challenges associated with it. So we started looking at what are potential opportunities for integrating to existing operations. We thought, okay, well, at least sulfur dusting might be an interesting one because it's pretty frequent. It's occurring roughly at the right time when we want to see some of the phenological development that's happening it happens at night, which allows us to control the lighting conditions and you get decent speed, which can be a challenge for imaging. Uh, so we started doing some testing. So this is sort of the engineering set of slides. Uh, we tested that we just built a small uh, data collection device here with an it, a camera and some, so we could characterize the vibration, various other pieces of what's what it's like to ride on the front of a tractor. Um, I'm going to skip that to, uh, yeah, characterize vibrations and motion, start thinking about how we build a more sophisticated device. We built another just real quick prototype device out of wood, added some lights, did it at night at the right speed. Started actually getting into some of, uh, some of the engineering pieces and said, all right, let's actually put something together we think might make a good first prototype. This is Bashal building this in the lab uh, over here. And then we went out and deployed this just on a side-by-side -side at the same vineyards we were at in 2019 and collected uh, a good chunk of data, probably for several hundred acres that we're currently chewing through right now. Um, and what you can see here is this is kind of the output. You end up with several, we have a few cameras, they're looking both directions. You can run these AI enabled models right on board in the device. And I think there's a lot of opportunity here for using this. Uh, do I have, oh, I've got another video. I'm gonna skip that too. Uh, using this for this sort of prediction. So we have, then we said, okay, here's our old data. We've got these rows of yield. We wanna go from counting grapes directly to the yield monitor. And here was our old predictions, which didn't work very well. Um, what we do now is go in and say, let's go directly try to predict this yield. So we started doing that. Um, I'm going to skip this piece as it's not too important. So then we started getting some better results. So here's what we saw in this test set from our old, uh, from our old data from 2000, this should say 2019, excuse me, but you can see basically in the, the blue line are the predictions for yield, this is real yield, tons per acre, and the orange is the ground truth. And this is along um, this is along a row. So it's about 400, again, 400 meters. So you can see there's, we're starting to capture some of the um, same trends that we're seeing along the row by doing this. It's not perfect, and we do need to 
uh, we still got a lot of room to improve, but it, it's looking in the right direction there. And you can see that this is that same predicted versus uh, measured with the yield monitor correlations. And you can see some, some correlations in this case that are starting to look much stronger than our initial uh, tests. Uh, so now we went out and said, okay, well, we've got to start getting more images. And this is where I want you guys to contact us because we're in this stage where we're, we've been iterating, building a new sensing system. We want to go out and get a lot more data. So if you are, if you're using a yield monitor or you're particularly keen on it, uh, let me know, reach out. And so what we're doing here is again, trying to directly predict yield from this sensing kit. Here's our yield monitor data. Here's the sensing kit. Here's some uh, model in the middle. Um, got some blocks we went out and drove for about 50,000 grapevines in 2020, collected this data. And we're trying to put this on a, we're, we're starting to test this on a tractor for this coming season now. Um, here's the latest version. So this is the third iteration of the sensing kit. It's starting to get more sophisticated. We've got a number of different custom power and control components, custom enclosures. We're 3D printing these enclosures for the cameras. They're motorized so they can move up and down and find the right position within uh, the vineyard. They have a GPS at about half a meter resolution. We've got lights, which are like a stadium light, uh, which seem to help pretty well with our imaging. Um, and then finally, we want to bring this together. We've got, I've got another student who's working on, okay, this piece I talked about earlier, how do you take this ground-based data and start combining it with aerial data? Because there's a lot of useful information in both and they're not the same sorts of information. So this is a, another direction we're interested in uh, that's just getting going. So uh, I'm going to stop there. I know that was kind of a whirlwind. I do want to say thank you to a number of collaborators, the Stavros Vajukas and his lab, uh, Beth Forrestal, several people at E&J Gallo uh, for those initial data sets we collected. And then we've got funding from a number of different um, places. Uh, there, there is definitely at UC Davis, I should give a plug, there's a growing interest. We were recently awarded a USDA NSF uh, National AI Institute um, an institute at UC, centered at UC Davis. And I think we have, uh, there's a lot of opportunity for developing our agriculture specific AI and machine learning approaches. Um, most of the time we end up with sort of a technological byproduct of other industries, but I think uh, there's, there's a growing uh, awareness of what, what could be done here. And so I think there's really some great opportunities going forward across the board in viticulture and enology. So thank you. I'm muted. No, I'm not anymore. Thank you, Mason. Um, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Will you be able to type some answers in there? Sure. I can type um, them. Just because I know it's getting to lunchtime and everybody gets hungry and then they run away. So I wanted to make sure that we get to Andrew before that happens. <laughs> yep, no problem. Thank you, Thank guys. You. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, so our next speaker is Andrew McElrone. Um, he's a research plant patholo um, pathologist, plant physiologist. Sorry, Andrew, I just gave you a different uh, focus area. Not a problem. <laughs> plant physiologist at the USDA ARS. And he's actually based in the Department of Viticulture and Enology. So we, we see him as like our cousin. Um, thank you for presenting today. And um, I'll pop up when it gets like, close to the end of your time. Thank okay, you. Great. Thank you. You can hear me okay? That's fine. Okay. So uh, today I'll be talking about uh, technologies for uh, driving irrigation management. Thank you for organizing this and, and for the invitation to be here. Uh, and it's actually kind of perfect to follow up on Mason with his discussion about mapping yields, because this is the type of thing that we're trying to do to get to more precision management applications with mapping water use and stress within vineyards and, and orchards as well. And so uh, biometeorology is this, the study of the interaction between the biosphere, so the living organisms and the weather and climate in a given area. So, so for you, this is how your vines are interacting with the atmospheric conditions that are driving that water loss and causing the stress. So we are looking for some answers here that are, that are blowing in the wind. And we do this across very scale, various scales. So the cartoon image on the right um, shows a, a picture of a flux tower there on, on, the, on the bottom. I'll be talking a lot about ground-based sensors that we've worked on. And then towards the end of the talk, I'll get into integration that we're doing 
uh, with UAV operators as well as satellite remote sensing folks that are now mapping ET and stress uh, across a variety of levels here. So in irrigation management, we're really looking for, for to answer three questions. How much water to apply, when to apply it, and, and where to apply it. And I love the cartoon on the right. That's from PMS Instruments, one of the pressure bomb uh, companies, because it really shows you all of the things that you are trying to consider and that the vine is dealing with. So you have water supply that, that the roots are in contact with that's in the soil. You have the plant regulating the uptake of that water, which is ultimately being driven by the dry air or the atmospheric conditions, how windy it is. And so the plant's trying to regulate this. It's trying to maximize carbon capture for photosynthesis while minimizing water loss. And so we really want to have good estimates of, of the different components that, that go into this water balance that we're looking at here. And one of the key ones that really integrates the system very well is evapotranspiration. So ET, as I'll refer to it the, the rest of the time. So it's the evaporation of water from the soil itself, as well as what's being lost via transpiration from, from the grapevine leaves. And this integrates the system so well because you have the plant in touch with the, the water in the soil via its roots. You have it regulating the water loss and you have it in contact with the atmosphere that, that's driving that demand, as I mentioned. So, one of the common strategies that is used in irrigation management for wine grapes uh, and, and other grapes as well is deficit irrigation. And so ultimately what you're doing with this is you're purposefully supplying less water than a well-watered grapevine could use. These two pictures here illustrate this pretty well. Uh, the upper left one is from New York State, a more music habitat, much wetter place where you can get excessive growth. And, and this is pretty excessive in this picture. But we also see this in places here in the Central Valley where we water too much and you start to get a lot of excessive growth. And so deficit helps um, in many ways just because of reducing water use and the associated pumping costs that go along with this. It improves fruit quality um, for characteristics that are important for wine and for table grape production. But it can also help to control excess uh, vegetative growth reducing hedging costs that are associated with this, leaf removal uh, when trying to get light into the fruiting zone, and certainly reducing disease pressure here. And then finally, uh, in table grapes, it's also used um, for shrinking the harvest windows of, of table grapes. The picture on the upper right shows um, some table grapes that were being produced down in the Coachella Valley for a project that we were involved in where they were looking to see if they could use deficit irrigation to really shrink that window of time so they wouldn't have to have as many passes through there for the harvest. And it's used in other crops like almonds for, for inducing whole split and other things. So I really think about the system and a lot of people that, that work in, in this area think about it from a water balance perspective that can be illustrated here simply and thinking about each of your, your vines as a potted plant similar to what's on your porch where you have your inputs of water into there in terms of precipitation and, and irrigation. Typically have a little plate on your porch to catch the water that's coming out the bottom, but ultimately you want to put the right amount of water on so it's actually going to where the roots are. If you don't and there's too much of it, you get drainage out of the bottom of the system, you're starting to face regulations from the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act um, that will be looking at the nitrogen that's being carried with this. And then you can have runoff depending on slope uh, that you have. And ultimately, the one that we're really looking at um, most extensively is this ET that I mentioned before. So that's one of the major losses out of the system that, that we can quantify. We can do this remotely without um, touching the vines. And I'll talk about this in a variety of different ways. So lots of people like to do this by looking at changes in, in soil uh, moisture. This doesn't necessarily integrate the plant as well, but it can get you some information there. But ultimately, you can see these changes. Um, uh, through the signature that you would see in the soil moisture sensor. So there's lots of things to consider when you're doing your irrigation management, as, as many of you already know, the evaporative demand, the climate that you're in, uh, how hot is that air, what is the growth stage of the vine? So depending on how large the canopy is at, at different ages, as well as throughout the season, are there cover crops there? What type of trellis system do you have? Slope, vine health will integrate into this. So how much water they're using will certainly be impacted by diseases and other things that may cause them to close their stomata. And then certainly soil types and, and other things going on uh, underground as well. So there's lots of factors to consider here. And ultimately coming back to this question of, of these three um, answers that we're looking for for irrigation management of how much water to apply, when to apply it and, and where to apply it. 
I'll be talking most extensively here about the vine water use and, and water stress uh, in the first parts uh, of the talk of how we're getting at this, new technologies that are available to do this, as well as giving a little bit of historical perspective. And then finally, just touching on some, some new things in terms of spatially, a spatial delivery of water to account that, that actually fits with these mapping, whether it's from yield or, or stress or ET other things. And so I'm gonna first dive into vineyard water use. And if you've seen Larry Williams talk in the past, you, you've seen a slide that looks like this. He's did a lot of pioneering work for our industry, looking at grapevine um, calculations of grapevine water use using the CIMIS system, so the California Irrigation Management Information System. And this consists of a series of stations like the one shown on the right that are located throughout the state and are typically over a well-watered model grass or some other model plant. And it's looking at the ET is essentially a model of how much water that grass would use under the current climatic or weather conditions that, that that's seeing. And then to get to grapevine evapotranspiration from here, you have a crop coefficient. And this is the work that Larry did at the Wang lysimeter for years and then translated that with shaded area under the vines and things. But what comes with this is the assumption behind these models is that you have disease-free plants grown under optimum soil conditions. And I just talked about how deficit irrigation is so important for us. So, so we're already stressing the plants, whether the relationship remains linear under those conditions is some questions, whether it's different among varieties in these different locations, how far are you located from a SIMA station? There's lots of reasons why we want better resolution data that actually accounts for the dynamic nature of the plants that you are actually trying to grow and get yield from. So, what we set out to do, my first uh, graduate student, uh, Tom Chaplin, uh, and I working with collaborators at UC Davis, was really could we replace CIMIS and, and do things more on site uh, to measure actual crop water use in an effective way. And so we went back to an existing technology surface renewal that was developed by Chata Pau, uh, Rick Snyder and others at, at UC Davis. But it was essentially a research grade tool um, that took a lot of technical know-how to do it and cost about $10,000 to run. So this is not gonna be something that you would see in a typical vineyard uh, to do this. We really wanted to dive into it and see if we could get it to a commercial application with this. The idea behind uh, surface renewal, as well as all of the other concepts that I'll be talking about today is energy balance partitioning. So, so what we're doing here um, is accounting for the energy that ultimately drives the water evaporation in the system, whether it's from the leaves or from the ground. So we look at the net radiation coming in, so from the sun and what's bouncing off uh, any of the objects that are in there, primarily the sun really driving this. And then that energy gets partitioned into three places. So it gets absorbed by the canopy and then it, it's re-radiated and it's exchanged with the air. So that's the sensible heat flux, which involves turbulence theory. A portion of it goes into the ground heat flux, this, this component here. So it's heating up the ground and, and getting stored in there and, and released at, at later time. And then the remainder of that energy goes into evaporating water. So this latent heat flux is, the, is what ultimately drives the evapotranspiration from the vines. So what we do with these methods is we're calculating the first three of these. We're measuring them directly, net radiation, sensible heat flux and ground heat flux and then coming up with an estimate, the remainder of that energy that goes into it. So essentially, we've focused a lot of time on the sensible heat flux side of this. And the concept is very similar to you boiling water on the stove. So you're actually doing energy balance approaches at home on a regular basis with this. So the, the, the net radiation or the, the bulk of the energy coming in is coming from the burner uh, seen on the bottom of this. You have some of that conducted into the metal itself going out into the handle. That's equivalent to like the ground heat flux of going into the surface. Uh, and then you have convection. So after, after it's been absorbed and then re-radiated into that, you get convective heat transfer in that fluid. Uh, and that would be like the sensible heat flux. And then the remainder of that energy goes into evaporating water. So the steam that's coming out of the top of that pot. So we're doing similar types of things in, in your vineyards and thinking about this. So the most complicated part of this that we had to deal with was the sensible heat flux. So this is the turbulence part of it. And I'm gonna show a video here that demonstrates what's going on with air movement across a vineyard. So you have a prevailing wind moving from the left to the right on your screen across this. You have air moving very slowly as it's in touch, in contact with the surface at the bottom. Uh, and that's the boundary layer where it slows down due to friction. And then what happens is, and I'll play this again, but I want you to pay attention to these ejection events here. 
is what happens is, is as the air is coming across, you start to get these exchange events where you get pulses of heat coming back out of there that are carried in that wind. And we'll see that in those ejections as we, as we get to the end of this video. But what we had to do was actually uh, go back in and figure out where the signature of this was. So this is a two-dimensional image from the side of a, a vineyard. This is happening in 3D space and how do we account for this uh, most effectively. So with these methods, what we end up doing is we need to account for the prevailing wind. Uh, we station a tower, which is shown here at the middle of what is a wind rose. So you see the compass directions on this wind rose plot here. And in this case, in this given plot, you have the tower here and it's picking up the signature from the land that is to the northwest of this. So the wind is coming from the northwest down towards that tower, so you have to position it uh, accordingly. And then the data gets filtered based on where the, the wind is coming from in, in these methods. So uh, in theory, surface renewal actually works in this way where you have these air parcels which are illustrated by these cubes coming into contact with, with a plant canopy here. So the theoretical temperature trace is actually shown just below that for each one of these. You have a period where that air parcel sits there and there's not much happening, then you start to get some energy exchange. And in this case, the air parcel is heating up, it's turning red, and you can see that in, in a temperature measurement. And then the surface gets renewed. You have a new air parcel come in and it bumps that existing one out and the surface is being renewed and you get a big drop in temperature at that time. And this repeats over and over and over again. So that's what theoretical data actually looks like, but this is what data in reality looks like when you measure this with a, a fine wire thermocouple. So that's shown there on the right uh, and relative to the size of, of a matchstick. Um, and without going into all the math, ultimately what, what Tom was able to do with his dissertation and some postdoc work was to figure out the math behind where the signatures were actually being carried in this data that was measured above the canopy uh, and remove the expensive research grade um, calibration that was needed. So he took this um, through a couple of incubators, the Y Combinator, uh, and got money in Silicon Valley and eventually started Pooley Technologies to, to get this out there uh, in, in what was a joint patent between UC Davis and USDA um, for this. So they built this really nice software stack that delivers the data um, for individual sites. And I'll come back to this idea of the cage around the thermocouple. This is these thermocouples that we use are, are very fragile, and so they require this cage to do this. So we're always looking for alternative ways to actually get at this. So we calibrated that against um, at the Wang lysimeter, comparing it to those numbers, got really good relationships here shown on the left. Also did it at that same site with, with soil moisture balance um, with this, finding really good relationships uh, amongst this if you're measuring everything really effectively. So there are other companies out there that are doing this now um, with some interesting approaches. Arable is, is one that's out there. Uh, Adam Wolf, the founder of that, actually worked with uh, Chalte Pau as well. Uh, they use slightly different equations in terms of that, how they get there, but the ideas are similar. So there's, there's more of these types of products coming onto the marketplace now that you should be aware of um, and, and some pretty sleek designs like the, the one that's associated with Arable. So the other thing, that needs to come from these sensors is, is this question about when. So when do we need to apply the water? And that's really based on, on stress. And so there's a variety of ways that people have been doing this for a long time. So on moisture sensors, barometry, actually measuring the gas exchange um, coming out of those leaves. Pressure bomb is one of the most typical ones. I'm trying to get at it with aerial imagery, with NDVI and other things like that. Some of these are very uh, human labor intensive and, and time intensive. Most of them are just point measures. So a single vine here or there that doesn't give you much information about the variability that you might see in your plot. And so one of the things that we went back to that had been used for a long time were infrared sensors that are shown down here that you can measure canopies and you could do it over larger swaths or down to the single vine with this. And so we, we were exploring this from the sense similar to what people had done originally of looking at stress uh, folks have been look, using this type of sensor since the 80s to do this in a, in a very similar way to the energy balance approaches that I told you before is if you can account for where that energy is going, you should be able to know how much transpiration is going on. And we've done this in, in some vineyards here locally uh, and in Napa and other places and found good relationships between these models um, that come from these infrared data with other weather parameters that go with it and leaves to model conductance. 
what we're most excited about with this is that these are super rugged sensors. So they can go out, they're easy to use and put on the data logger. Um, but we started playing around with these for actually measuring uh, the canopy temperatures at one hertz. So we, we got a new sensor from Apogee and, and we started measuring that compared to our thermocouple measurements. And we wanted to see if we could actually get to the water use. So we needed, we have the water stress that's covered by these sensors, but we also wanted to do water use in what is a more rugged sensor. And so you can actually see from this of a temperature trace, this is the IRT sensor, this infrared radiometer, and you see the ramps actually reflected, the same ones that you see in the air above the canopy, you see those same ones, they're a little dampened because there's thermal inertia of the canopy. It takes longer for that energy exchange to happen. But we actually worked through this to figure out um, where the signature was with this. We have a paper that we just submitted last week looking at this across a, vari a variety of cropping surfaces where we compared eddy covariance surface renewal, like the technique that we used in the past. We did this at the weighing lysimeter. To what is this new IRT wavelet method that we're actually doing? And you can see that they actually match up pretty well across several days where you see those things falling out. Um, and this is for the sensible heat flux that's used to calculate in an energy balance approach. And then the linear regression. So these, these H's here is sensible heat flux with the wavelet method, and then the sensible heat flux with eddy covariance and getting a really good fit between these um, for a variety of different cropping surfaces. There's still some things for us to resolve in terms of directionality, row orientation, and other things, how to pick it up. But we are very hopeful that this will be a useful tool for us, um, both for uh, direct measurement, for water use, and for stress of the vines, but also for ground truthing remote sense tools. And that's what I'm gonna dive into here next, just to give you in the last little bit of the, the talk, um, that these could also be serving as, as a really important ground truthing for the models that are used for mapping ET from, from more remote sensely, remotely sensed type data. So I've been involved in, in what's called the GRAPEX experiment. Um, and something is actually, I always forget the acronym at the top. I'll let you just read that about atmospheric profiling and evapotranspiration experiment that we're doing. This was a project that was started by Bill Kustis and Martha Anderson, USDA scientists that are with the Remote Sensing Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. And their goal was they had developed a model for actually mapping ET using two-dimensional thermal images from satellites. So they actually figured out how to partition the energy from looking at these images um, that provide 30 by 30 meter resolution of thermal images that have been taken from uh, of the Earth's um, surface for a long time from the Landsat satellite. So ultimately, what we're doing with these is we have now for grapevines, we have 13 different flux towers maintained um, throughout the state to ground truth um, these efforts. And I'll give you a bit more detail about how that's going down. But the picture on the bottom shows you the type of mapping that we're doing. On the bottom right, it is down to 30 by 30 meter uh, resolution. So ultimately what we're doing with this is, is very similar. And the remote sensing scientists are the actual ones, the ones that are doing uh, the math and, and the extraction of this information from those images. But we're really trying to partition the energy again, similar to what we described, but using this thermal imagery to do it. And we really want to partition both what's used by the vines themselves as well as the soil of evapotranspiration. Surface renewal can't give you that type of information because it gives you the whole footprint of the land. But these image methods um, may allow you to get to that point. And we're actually hopeful that the wavelet method can get you there as well, because you can point the sensor at the middle if there's cover crops or at the crop itself to really partition this out. And so really it's a two source energy balance approach is that that's taken into it without getting into the details of this, looking at what water is coming from the soil itself and how much is coming from the canopy. And again, we have a variety of different methods to ground truth this across uh, different scales as, as we're doing it. This data is going to be coming online um, via the Open ET project. This is something, uh, if you're not aware of it, you should be aware of it. Uh, there was a project that was established by the Environmental Defense Fund, NASA, and Google Earth Engine to map ET throughout the Western US. And so this was at larger spatial resolution, but growers uh, are also involved in this project. Folks from Gallo um, specifically are working uh, with this team and um, to adapt this for use in irrigation management. And so it's actually an enormous project uh, and this data is gonna be out there for your sites. And I'll show you some examples of this. 
So the, the objective of this was to, to produce reliable ET data. So Forrest Melton is the lead PI on this, and he's down at Cal State Monterey Bay uh, and, and really doing all of the cat herding and, and incredible coordination of all of these different groups. Uh, and, and really what they want is, is to provide this data in real time. It was originally more from a policy perspective, but, but definitely from irrigation management. And this is where we will be pushing data through the open ET platform so that we're not reinventing the wheel in terms of the software stacks and things that Mason talked about before. Um, so really we want a cost effective grower friendly tool to more effectively manage irrigation uh, in, in a spatially resolved way. So the, the model open ET actually uses six uh, different models that have been uh, tested. The one that we have that Bill Kustis and Martha Anderson and those folks developed with USDA is this Lexi Dyslexi down in the bottom left. But there are five other models, and those are being compiled into an ensemble um, for the data that comes out from that. So what we've been doing uh, at all of these sites, we have towers that look like this at every one of those 13 sites that I was telling you about. And we essentially just measure the hell out of the place. We have soil moisture sensors. We're measuring leaf area indices, including um, destructive harvesting of plants at different times of the year, looking at the development with phenocams, surface renewal stations, eddy covariance, sap flow sensors. Um, it, you name it, it, it was actually installed in, in these sites and, and monitoring this so that we can tell how well, how well those, mod those models from space are actually working um, uh, against what we're actually measuring with gold standards on the ground. So we also do this when the satellites are passing overhead. We send uh, up to 20 to 30 people, depending uh, at what time it is, out into the field to measure things like gas exchange and and measurements underneath the vines versus out in the middle in terms of radiation models and things. And then there's drone flights that also occur with a Utah State team that we've actually worked with. And they do this at different heights with the quadcopter drone, as well as a bi-wing that can fly higher. And many of you are being inundated with companies that say that they're providing this type of stuff. Ultimately, we want the outcomes of, of, uh, of this research to be embedded into those platforms. So those companies have really great software stack that deliver the, the data very effectively. And, and ultimately we want the science embedded uh, with, within what those companies are actually doing. So in the last few slides that I have, um, this is just a, a map of where we have those great back sites and an example in the bottom left of the E-team mapping going across the season. Figures on the left are from April for three different sites. So the northernmost in Sonoma, the southernmost down in Ripperdan, southwest of Madera. Uh, and with a load of site in between and going up to September. And you see the changes that, that you get in terms of the ET across those sites um, throughout the season. Uh, they have compared this both from the ground-based measurements. So the, the dark solid line here is actually um, what is modeled from, from the, the space, um, from the remotely sensed data. And the red dots are what's actually measured on the ground. And across several years, they've actually gotten good fit with this. The gray actually represents the spatial variability that you can have within a given plot and, and the variability as you move around within, within a given site. So this is from this Lodi site, sites one and two, um, that had very different canopy sites just due to age differences and, and variability differences am, amongst that within, within that mapping and why it's important to actually get down to some of these more precision uh, measurements. And then the last thing that I'll describe is uh, we've been doing this in a variable rate uh, irrigation system that Gallo has at the Ripper Dam site, where we've been imposing stress in the two upper blocks, no stress in this lower one, and a moderate stress here. And I'll just scroll through some images. So this is the same plot, split that up into quadrants here, um, where you can see it prescribed by the irrigation here it would be more water down here, where we're aiming to avoid stress and, and less in the top. And they were prescribing that based on the ET that was being mapped there. Um, and then adjusting as we went across the top, you see the calendar date changing. Um, and then towards the, the end of the season, when we were really looking to impose those differences, you can see the variability um, in those plots, but the stress that was actually imposed. And each of these squares is that 30 by 30 meter resolution. And the water was being prescribed according to what we saw the plants were actually doing uh, under these conditions. So in conclusion, I, I showed you a lot of data about uh, vine water use and water stress with new um, ground-based as well as remotely sensed tools that are coming online for you. And then the very last thing I wanted to show you is that 
the capability to actually deliver water is also coming along. There are companies actually working on this spatial variability issue, and Waterbit is one of those. Um, they have since gone under since I made this slide uh, originally last year, but they have been absorbed by another company. Um, and they are developing um, spatially resolved irrigation systems to actually match uh, some of this mapping data that you're actually starting to see. And so with that, there are a whole lot of people involved in, in all aspects of this work that I appreciate their efforts on uh, and uh, happy to take any questions if there are. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, we have one question. Um, have you looked into the increasing poor water quality and how it affects vine physiology? So um, I imagine that's in terms of salts and boron and, and bicarbonates and, and other things that people are evaluating. That is something that, that we will be, um, that we can do within these mapping uh, strategies. We, we've done that in, in other studies. Um, and it definitely impacts your ET. So, so going back to that idea of the original sort of static crop coefficient SIMIS model, that doesn't pick up sort of that dynamic changing, uh, the changing conditions of what salts, viruses, other diseases can actually change in there. And I think this is where the mapping will, will be able to help that and spot those, those weak points. We definitely see those. And we're in an almond orchard doing this right now. And you have a big boron problem in the upper left corner of it and the trees are smaller, you see the ET signature reflecting that and it comes out in the stress signature that we see as well. Okay, yeah, that makes absolute sense. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew. We are over time. So I'm going to wait for any more questions. I hope people can just email you directly if they have any more questions. And um, I would like to thank all the speakers for spending time with us today and giving really great talks. We really appreciate that you um, contribute to our extension program. And uh, I would like to thank Karen Block and Caroline Furman because they're actually the people that do all the logistics and everything else that takes sucks up loads of time. And for TNTN for working with us first time. And it was a great experience. And thank you for all your direction and support in getting this program together. Um, and that's my story. And Karen always falls in what I forget. Well, we'd like to thank all of our speakers. We'd like to thank our extension partners. We'd like to thank all of you for attending. And um, we hope that you all have a great day and a good season. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hopefully thank you we'll very much. get together in person um, by the end well, of the year. I assume the next on the road or program in Kern County would be in person because it wouldn't we'll be, be on person. the road. <laughs> Yes, please look Thank forward you. to it. And also, maybe some people are leaving now. I want to thank Gabriel Torres, Matthew Fidelibus, and also Don Lewis to help me to kind of find the 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 the, the, people, the all those speakers, and then also help me to identify the need of the industry. I really appreciate the help given. I'm I'm a still eighty five percent new. <laughs> So thank you so much and also all the speakers to join us. Okay. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Have a good day and week. <laughs>